Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order for the June 3rd, 2021 Canal Recreation and Park District Board of Directors. Are your speaker? We've all got who everybody is here that's supposed to be here. So I'm going to have a flex. I'm going to ask Pam and Barbara, right? To, to, to lead the flag salute for us, please. You'll all join us together and salute the flag. So whenever you're ready, tell us to get started. Please stand, oh, cool. <laughs> Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we will be hearing from both of them later this evening. Do we have a roll call, please? Yes. Yes. Director Lang. Here. Director Holt. Yes. Yes. Okay, now we have our special presentations. And I see first on our list is the Chumash Indian Museum. So Barbara, if you want to join us at the podium and introduce yourself so we have it officially on record, and then uh, we'll look forward to hear what you have to say. All right, I'll take this off so you can hear me. <laughs> All right, well, thank you um, for the opportunity. I re re realized we didn't, weren't able to give a, a report last year due to COVID-19, so this is kind of a, a double year report. <laughs> But um, so I'm Barbara Tejada. I'm the board chair for the Oak Brook Park Chumash Indian Corporation, which is our official um, nonprofit's name, um, and that we operate the Chumash Indian Museum. So this is our report. Unfortunately, I um, forgot to print out a copy of this to distribute to everyone, but I can certainly forward that um, along to Tom that he can send out to everybody. So it's been quite the year. <laughs> um, so uh, our museum um, officially closed due to COVID-19 on March 13th um, of 2020. We uh, reopened briefly for two weeks in November and we got really good response and people coming in and then the guidelines changed and we had to close again. Um, we, because we primarily and all the access to the museum is um, an indoor operation, although we have outdoor facilities, um, guests have to come in through the inside. We decided we would just wait until the indoor museum guidelines were approved um, before we open. So, um, so although the grounds obviously were open, we didn't, um, we didn't open any earlier than that. So, um, so then we finally reopened again on April 10th of this year. So we were closed for about a year. Um, but in, um, it did make us kind of kick us into gear to become more uh, diversified with uh, online and digital outreach. Um, things that we, some, some of the things we talked about for a while, but never really had the time to do it, well, it kind of forced us to do it. Um, so we continued an active social media presence through Facebook and Instagram. And then um, we were um, hunting down a variety of grants to keep us going um, through, the, through the closure. Um, and we were actually really lucky to get um, a National Endowment of the Humanities. Uh, it was our first federal grant um, through the CARES Act. Um, that helped uh, fund a lot of these uh, digital um, and virtual experiences. Um, Ventura County Community Foundation grant, we just got a California Relief Grant and the Paycheck Protection Program, and of course all the support from CRPD and, and our donors um, kind of kept us going because primarily a lot of our, um, our income relies on admissions and obviously that was not happening <laughs> during this past year. So. Um, so now we can, um, we are open right now, Saturdays and Sundays. We revise the hours a little bit. We're 11 to three, um, but we're working toward reinstating our previous hours, which was set Saturday 10 to four, Sunday noon to four. Um, you can see our, the 2020 um, attendance really tanked compared to um, the previous years. Um, before the closure, we were actually on track to exceed our 2019 attendance, which was about, 
2,400 visitors. So we were doing better than we had that at that point in 2019, but obviously with the closure that that, that went out the window, but. Um, so we had our um, school tour. So since this is a couple of years, um, the presentation. So the, the school year 2018 to 19, we served 6,500 students. Um, the school year 2019 to 2020, which only went through the March 13th, so it was cut short. Um, it was 44, a little over 4,400 students. Um, we did, with the NEH grant, we were able to, to switch to a virtual program that we started kind of later in 2020. And um, through that virtual program, we were able to reach um, almost 4,000 students just for the, through the virtual um, uh, tour, which included the, the students would watch um, some videos that we made um, ahead of time. And then they would have a discussion period with one of our educators. So this is Brianna Rotella. Um, it's a picture from one of the, the virtual tours that she gives the students. So she has a variety of things to show them um, laid out in front of her. So we're hoping to um, reinstate uh, in some in-person field trips this fall. We've had some inquiries, um, particularly from from some of the private schools. We're not sure what the public schools are gonna be doing yet, but we. Um, but I think even so, we're gonna be continuing to offer our virtual tours. Um, and so as part of that, we expanded our webpage for educational resources to include various children's activities. There's coloring book, coloring sheets and word searches and things like that on our, on our website. Um, and then we started a new whole new video production series as part of the NEH grant. and, and, and very fortunately, our museum education specialist, Vivian Steindl, um, she has some experience in, in theater and um, her, uh, her partner does actually does camera work. So he really helped us, train us to do some of these videos. So we have a new YouTube channel um, with all these little um, informational videos with various members of our staff and board members and, and so forth um, on there. And uh, so we have 141 subscribers. This is not a lot in the YouTube world, but we've had about 8,000 views across all of our videos and we just started it. So we're hoping to continue, continue that for sure. Um, we, uh, we, every year we would do an a evening speaker series event. And obviously that had to go by the wayside, but um, the grant did fund um, four speaker series sessions and um, that we did online through uh, Zoom, Facebook Live, and then we recorded it for our YouTube channel. So we had between about 45 to 120 people at each of the four events. Um, but then there's over 2000 views total, like people could go back and watch it later. So, um, and then we had this one um, program that was about um, repatriation with the curator of the Fowler Museum um, at UCLA. And so they've also posted links to it through their website and all that kind of stuff. So. That was a, and with our and Nakia um, on our board. Um, we're hoping to restart our weekend learning events that were really popular before the closure. That includes the Archaeology Day, the Winter Solstice um, celebration, Ethnobotany Day. We're going to be doing Ethnobotany Day this year in July, um, and also First Skills Day, where we have flint napping and atlatl throwing, and you know, learning how to do make things. Um, we had just started doing these workshops, which were really popular, and we're hoping we can start doing that again so people would learn how to flint nap, make an arrowhead, arrow point. Um, we had a little basket weaving, and it was really popular. Um, and then just as the stars aligned, we have, a, there's a number of interesting books coming out. Um, so we're actually going to be doing several book signings this year. So our first one is scheduled for later this month. Um, uh, Chumash Tataviam elder uh, Alan Salazar just has a new, new children's book out that um, he's, he's going to do a book signing event at the, and reading at the museum. And we have, um, there's a garden book, um, Western garden book that the museum is actually featured in our ethnobotany gardens. Um, so they're going to be doing a book signing as part of our ethnobotany day in July. So these have always been really popular um, events. This is a photo from our last, from our ethnobotany day in 2019. I have to do the calculation. So while we were closed, it also pushed, we had a lot of gift shop inventory just kind of sitting there. And so uh, we still need to pay the bill. So we um, added onto our website a, a, an option, an online gift shop. 
and um, we had one of our our native artists that usually does like t-shirts and bags for us. She started doing uh, face masks. <laughs> and so that became a really popular, so popular that we were like, can you make more? We're sold out. So um, so we uh, so we did start our online gift shop sales. Obviously have kind of fallen off now, but um, but it's, we had over 22,000 visitors on to that store. And um, we brought in about 7,000 in revenue um, just through that to, to keep the lights on. So. Um, and just in the future for our regular gift shop, we're reaching out to more and more native artists and vendors to include more of their, um, their items in our gift shop. Um, we will be commencing group gatherings. We don't do a lot. We have a head of, we do no more than six weddings per year and they're very limited on size and times and noise and so forth. We do have a wedding scheduled, a small, it was just a ceremony scheduled for August. Um, and then we also do have sometimes tribal and community gatherings, picnic, picnics, tribal meetings and things like that. Um, so we do a little bit of that, not too much. Um, so uh, in our marketing, so we're up to over 2000 Facebook followers, almost 2000 Instagram followers now, which is a big leap from the numbers I presented last in 2018. Um, we've had over 25,000 unique, unique um, website visits since uh, January 2020. Um, we are the last check, the last uh, presentation I did, our email list was like 300. Now we're at six, over 1,600 people. So we notify them about events and everything. Um, and we're, you know, we really use our social media pages a lot to advertise events and so forth. Um, and then that gets picked up by other you know, goes not viral, but you know, <laughs> um, we we always every year we do the Malibu powwow and the Moore Park powwow as community outreach events. They obviously haven't been doing them um, the past couple of years, but hopefully next year we'll get back into to that. Um, since our last meeting, we've done some um, facility improvements pre-COVID. We we did get a small grant from the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, and it provided funding for um, installation of interpretive signs along the pathways um, outside the museum. So uh, there's one at the Lang Ranch oops, home site. Uh, there's one at the game field and one in the village kind of explaining a little bit about what they are and the name, you know, what they're called in Chumash language. Um, we continue restoring our village after the Woolsey fire. Uh, finding Thule is really hard uh, to come by. And so we have um, been working I'm always on the lookout. Is that Thule? Is that Thule in that pond? So, um, so we've got some relationships now with the Camarosa Water District and also Apricot Lane Farms um, that we have um, harvested Thule from. Um, and uh, we we got a new utility vehicle after after the Woolsey fire, um, and now we have a protective storage for that because during COVID the the we discovered that the squirrels like eating all the seat belts and all the seats. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, we've been kind of growing our research library. Um, it's not really open to the public, but it's available right yet, but it's open to staff and our volunteers. Um, and we've been kind of growing that, um, you know, through various donations and things and books. Um, we, little by little, we're always working on tweaking and updating our exhibits um, and um, upgrading and we're almost complete refurbishing our curation room that it actually now looks like a curation room um, for the storage of some museum collections we've been working with Stagecoach on transferring over. So. Um, the one other thing that the NAH CARES grant provided us was funding um, to get, well, we bought a better camera to help with some of the videos as well, um, but also to take photos of our collections so that we can have an online collections um, database that um, is already available through our past perfect software that we use for um, cataloging the collections. So right now you can go online. We have 126 objects from our collections online and you can learn, um, you see a photo of it. There's a little bit of descriptive information about it. Um, and we're, we're continuously looking to add additional things on there as, um, as we kind of build that, that whole thing up. So it's a little extra virtual online thing. <laughs> so, um, so right now we have four part-time staff to cover our visitor services and education. Um, we lost one staff member um, during the, the COVID thing. He ended up getting a job elsewhere. 
Um, we have about a dozen volunteers that are kind of getting going again with us, um, helping out, you know, everything on the weekends, the special projects. Um, so we're hoping to kind of reboot our volunteer program and build that up again um, after our closure. Um, we, we have, we work with Eagle Scouts a lot. So we've got a couple of small potential Eagle projects to build some more benches for our game field coming up. Um, we made a really good um, contact with the Bank of America, Native American Employee Outreach Group, who helps us out with various things. And they've been, you know, they gave us donations, a, a donation of, you know, hand sanitizer and mask and all that for, for our reopening. Um, and of course, we coordinate with Stagecoach Museum on the collections, various educational things. So financial stability, we're kind of rebuilding. Um, during the closure, we were looking at every opportunity to cut costs. Um, so we found ways to, you know, cut back on our phone and internet costs, for example, like, you know, how can we cut th this out and that out? We, you know, reduce our cut back to our trash service, um, found a, a way, a better way to purchase cleaning supplies that would provide a larger discount. Um, and uh, we discovered TechSoup, which offers um, really discounted software to nonprofit organizations. So we were able to cut a lot of, you know, just our Microsoft Office account is now free because we go through TechSoup. It's not, so we're saving $10 a month. You know, so it's not a lot, but every little bit was counting at that point. Um, and of course, we were looking for all the grant opportunities possible. We have now have a subscription to Grant Station, which we can go in and look for different grant opportunities. Um, there. So you can see kind of the difference between 2019 and 2020. The big, um, the big blue in the 2019, most, where most of our income comes is from school visits. And obviously that same blue color is a lot smaller in 2020, but the big purple is grants. So that's really, it's the grants that really sustained us um, through the, through the, uh, through the COVID. It's, 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 a little more work for grants because there's, you know, there's writing it and I'm working on the final report right now. And so there is a little, you have to research the right ones, but, um, but it's something that we've always been trying to get to do more. And we were lucky enough to be able to get, get some to keep us, keep us afloat um, for the most part. Um, and you can see our expenses. It's still mostly um, personnel and, and wages, but um, we have cut down our utilities at, at least through the closure. Um, but this is, it's kind of just interesting to see the different the colors. So like I said, I'll um, distribute the, the presentation to all of you. So what next? Well, we're rebooting. We're going to continue building on those virtual offerings that we had over the from the closure. We're going to expand on a lot of the public programming that we had really um, been successful for in 2019, which are those weekend educational events, our workshops um, that were getting to be really popular and then everything shut down. Um, we're continuing to enhance and further our collections management and diversifying our income streams. And we wanted to thank you. We'd like to acknowledge the ongoing support from CRPD board and the staff in supporting the museum, especially in this very challenging year. Um, it's been it, it's been very appreciated. There were a couple times I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Um, and uh, but we've managed to come through it with your support and we thank you very much. And we look forward to a much better 2021. So any thank questions? Thank you so much, Barbara. <laughs> Director Huffer, do you have any questions or comments? A comment, obviously, you folks have not just been sitting on your hands going, woe is me, woe is me for the past year. You have been so busy. And I'm really impressed by you must have a, a massive IT staff doing all of this web and internet and social media stuff. I mean, you must have hundreds of staff doing all this for you. I wish. No, we've all, it's all been trial and error. <laughs> well, I, from what you've showed us, it looks like it's been a very successful trial and, and probably <laughs> lots of success and very little error. So I'm, I'm really impressed by what you guys have been doing. I'm looking forward to being able to get back over there. And you did answer one of my questions about that. I never can remember what those tent-like things are called with the Thule, but- um, The ops. 
Okay. The op, yeah. <laughs> right. that, what you said. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I know there, there are several uh, local nonprofits that would love to be able to help in, in getting those back together once groups can start to meet and once you nail down your sources of toolies. So, yes, thank absolutely. You Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Director Holt, do you have any questions or comments? No questions. I'm just very impressed how you've kept things going during this time and uh, have made adjustments and improvements. And, and I look forward to going there again. I've always yeah. enjoyed my little excursions there. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Director you. Cusworth? No, this, this is one of my homies. <laughs> so, um, but I have to say, I mean, even though she doesn't have a large staff, I would be continually amazed how at one meeting they'd say, we should do this, and then at the next meeting it's done. You know, <laughs> or I'd look at their website and, you know, things would get done very quickly. So she has an incredibly efficient staff and uh, really good people working there. So I'm glad that we have such a wonderful uh, museum here in our valley with such dedicated people. I mean, you all know Barbara is a volunteer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is my second unpaid job. <laughs> but no, we have a really great team at the at the museum. I think everyone works really well together um, between the board and the staff, and um, and we just have really passionate staff members. So, Director Lang. Yes, so uh, Barbara, I'm really pleased to see the energy that you're bringing to the. <laughs> rebooting uh, situation and also the energy and work that you put into keeping it going as other directors have said and uh, at one time as a board member I used to be very involved in the startup days of uh, the Schumacher Union Museum and so I have a real fond memory of many aspects of the uh, facility the venue but I just got to thinking, you, I think you did cover one of the, well, the major funding is school visits, mm -hmm. but also general visitors, correct? Yes, yes that's correct. And yeah. an idea just popped into my head while listening to you to kind of reboot getting visitors. Maybe once everything opens, you can have a Lang Ranch community potluck, you know, put on some type of uh, uh, Indian event and so forth, program or whatever, mm -hmm. and get the neighbors because when the mm -hmm. neighbors have friends of theirs come to visit them, what do we do? Here's something special that not many neighborhoods, you know, can <laughs> offer. So it might just kind of regenerate their thinking as to here right in our own backyard. Uh, and you also might get a lot of additional volunteers from an event like that. So bringing people together. So anyway, uh, best of luck in the uh, coming months and year. And I hope to, as other directors have said, I too hope to get back over there. So thank you again. That's great. Yeah, we have that big custom made barbecue that, that we can have. Oh, we just worked with the neighbors because we just had a a sick bobcat that had been sighted around the neighborhood and then it was seen in the museum over or at the museum property over the weekend and we managed to find a wildlife rehab center and they came out and and got and so that generated actually a lot of social media amongst the local neighborhood um about the you know this poor little bobcat um and uh so yeah that's a good way of reaching out to the neighbors yeah um in the past uh, I was involved in a, a large men's group associated with the church, and we probably had three or four big events there, breakfast, you know, hiking to the caves, and mm -hmm. uh, just general hiking and so forth. And through that, uh, I know at least two families, this goes back quite a few years, at least two families stayed with volunteering at the museum. So Great. the more you can provide opportunities for you know, people to interact. I think the higher percentage that they're going to get more volunteers and then some donations or whatever. So yeah, absolutely. Again, good job, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Just a quick comment on the presentation. Thank you. It was, I think you did a great job. Got a lot of good information there. Looking forward to getting the hard copy of that. But I just was curious. You know, 
we know that the Chumash Museum is there and some people know, but not the whole community knows. But I just, with, with the other resources, because the Chumash influence is a regional thing, it's not a Caneo mm -hmm. Valley thing. Right. Uh, with the various resources that, that you know, either schools or uh, you know, those that are interested want to do research that they can go to, what's, what is it about your facility that draws someone to, to this location as opposed to somewhere else? If they want to get research or if they want a museum, uh, you know, what's unique about it that draw people to it? I think, um, I mean, we've, we special, specialize in school tours for a long time. So we get schools from like all over LA and because there's nothing quite like it that you have, it's a small museum, but we have the grounds um, and the, we, with the little hiking trails, we have the replica village. And then, um, so people really get a hands-on, you know, you're in the beautiful Oak Woodland there. Um, and people really like the location part, partly. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of, you know, there are multiple different Chumash um, groups, um, but we try to kind of encompass, you know, everyone and, and uh, represent all the different um, uh, locations. But there isn't really a dedicated Chumash museum, except for they're building one in San Inez. Um, but, and that's going to be a big, but that's still far away. And so we're much closer to Los Angeles and we, we do get a lot of, um, people coming out from the greater LA area, um, out to, to, because it, it is one of the few dedicated Native American museums that's open regularly. I know there, there are some, a couple of facilities down in Los Angeles, but they're, you know, one Saturday a week, or I mean, one Saturday a month, um, or there's larger things like the Autry, which is you know, more general Native American, but we're very specific to the, the Chumash people that were in this greater area. So it is kind of a unique experience. And a lot of the, the events that we have, we pull from the Native, um, the Native cultures around us, various artists, singers, dancers, um, and people always enjoy um, seeing that. So it's a very different experience versus like Satwiwa at National Park Service, which they do have events um, but they're, again, they're not really specific just to the Chumash. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thanks, because I, I know that we've all been there and realized what a treasure it is. And certainly we're jealous of having it here, uh, <laughs> we're protective of that. But it's nice to know it's re the regional influence. And obviously now you've got that online influence beyond that. So kudos to you. Director Lang, another Yes, comment? thank you, Ron Quickie. I have a friend who is an author, Native American, and he um, is willing to do a book signing. He, uh, in fact, he was scheduled to be, before you came on board mm -hmm. you know, during the transition. So if you are looking for an, another event uh, such as that, just let me know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we found the book signings are actually pretty popular. <laughs> We've only yeah. had one or two, but uh, suddenly all these books are coming out this year. I guess everyone had the time during COVID. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the presentation. We look forward to getting back over there again. Thank you. Barbara. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We do have a second presentation tonight. And with us also is the Caneo Valley Historical Society. And uh, Pam Bond is with us this evening. But I, but I think someone else snuck in. So, yes. So if you want to join us and, again, uh, uh, introduce yourselves uh, for, for us and for everybody else. And you know, feel free to mass so we can make sure we can hear you all but but I love the outfits so maybe you can tell us about that too so and, and your names don't forget okay my name is Pam Pund and I'm the president of the Caneo Valley Historical Society which um, oversees the Stagecoach Inn Museum Complex and it standing to the side of me is Jana Goldsworthy who is our um, director at the uh, Stagecoach Inn Museum and she'll be doing the presentation today and I'll be cheering her on. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the biggest differences that's taken place since uh, we last presented to you, which I'm guessing was mid 2019 maybe, um, that um, our longtime director, Sandy Hildebrunn, who had been there for decades with just a few interruptions, um, had uh, has, has moved on to different things and she's can't take herself away from the stage coach gym, so she's now on our board of trustees. Um, and I came on, think about the timing here, I came on in February 
of 2020. So I was just a month in the director's seat when COVID hit. So it's been a very interesting experience. And I am so grateful that um, there was such an amazing team of volunteers in place, that we have so much support from CRPD, and that we have such dedicated members and um, community members who really um, enjoy our facility. One of the things that we had talked about before COVID, uh, Pam and I were kind of brainstorming about things that we wanted to do. And one of the main things that we wanted to do, um, go to the next slide. Um, um, one of the main things that she wanted to do, sorry. Um, one of the main things that um, we wanted to do was expand our um, social media uh, presence and broaden our audience, attracting new and different types of guests to the property. And we wanted to put the stagecoach in back in the center of the community. Uh, the Stagecoach and Museum, you may or may not know, originally built as the Grand Union Hotel in 1876, was the first commercial enterprise in the area beyond the ranches. So um, it enjoyed a very central location. It was the place to be. And um, we've had the community rally around us time and time again when, um, when we were in the way of the 101 freeway and the Historical Society formed to move the museum. The community came together and really supported us. Um, and again, when uh, unfortunately just a short time later, the museum burned to the ground. Again, the community rallied. And so we've enjoyed this really wonderful uh, position of having the community support us. And we feel like in recent years, we've lost a little of that. Not, not that people don't support us, but just that the activities taking place at the inn are not drawing as consistently people in. And so one of the things we wanted to do is offer diverse um, types of activities and bring lots of different people, um, re-educating them about this wonderful treasure we have in our community. Because we still hear people saying, oh, I've been a resident for 30 years and I didn't know you were here. So um, as the new director, um, my, the main thing I wanna just say again is I'm so excited to have CRPD as our partner and supporting us. Um, it's been amazing um, how much uh, we've been able to rely on you. And, um, so in coming in, I, um, you know, notice the quote at the bottom here, I never promised you a rose garden. Well, we do have a lovely one, um, but uh, certainly what I was prepared for and what Pam and I had discussed um, in terms of our goals and strategies was gonna, we're gonna have to be morphed a little bit um, to deal with COVID. It's been interesting though, because I actually think, and Barbara mentioned this too, that in a lot of ways, COVID pushed us to do things that we'd planned to do anyway. It just made us do them more rapidly. Um, one of the reasons that Pam and I addressed in our period of tire today is that um, the idea that we've really tried to stress through COVID is if you can't come to the museum, we'll bring the museum to you. And so that's what we're doing here today. And I have a little different emphasis with my presentation. Uh, I brought you uh, annual reports for 2019 and 2020, as well as financials for just a, our recent financial position as of June 2nd, I think it is. Um, so. You have lots of facts and figures in there, lots of comparative data, um, as well as pictures. But what I wanted to do today as we talk about what we're doing and have been doing is to allow you, and I assume you can see a screen. I feel like I'm the only one watching a screen. Yeah, but okay. um, I wanted to be able to give you a little taste of um, what's going on at the museum. Like the Chumash Museum, um, one of our major programs is school tours. And um, we have, a we're booked a year or two ahead um, normally, and uh, there was a lot of disappointed school children when we had to cancel. Um, and of course, this was a huge uh, blow to our revenue stream. Also, um, weddings is a very important part of our revenue stream, and that was obviously with COVID greatly interrupted. So we had to get very creative very fast. Um, not only were we missing the gate fees, but we were missing these two major sources of revenue. So uh, we just amped up the speed on some of the things we were planning on doing already, which were um, coming up with some different ways to present the history of the region. Um, our curator of history, of course, during uh, the COVID closures continued uh, with acquisitions and developments and um, 
We were working on all of our preservation. We're digitizing the collection. A lot of work has been done on that during COVID. So we've continued to make progress with the preservation of history, but we really needed to shift how we were gonna present it because normally, um, hopefully most of you have been out to the facility, but if you haven't, uh, you're typically greeted by costume docents and we give very personal tours and talk and a very hands-on look at what life was like in the late 1800s and through the present time. Um, our curator of collections has continued to be busy during COVID closures and we actually have some re received some really beautiful donations. I think what happened during COVID is that a lot of people cleaned out their houses and we had almost daily um, people calling to say, would you like this? Uh, and we have to be choosy because we do have very little storage space and um, though we're trying to expand that as well as our display space, um, we have to be selective. Uh, here pictured are just a few things that we got uh, this past year. On the left are some it's a beautiful collection of Havel in China. Um, that's our spring table that we've set. We also have a collection of Hunt, uh, the Hunt family Havel in China, but um, this is what we put out for spring. In the center, we got a working um, diorama of a stagecoach and that one you can actually flip the lights on and it moves and the scenery goes by and um, that was made by a local resident. Um, and then on the right, I just shared one of our many beautiful um, uh, wardrobe pieces. And uh, that is actually taken at our suffrage exhibit, which was the first exhibit that we put on when we were able to reopen. Like the Chumash Museum, we were closed on March 13th and we opened in early August as an outdoor only museum. We were blessed that we could be creative. We have a big property, four and a half acres that we could utilize in different ways to um, offer the, the public a way to spend the day out enjoying the museum, even though we could not go inside. And so our suffrage exhibit was part of our theme for the year. Our theme was women in history. And we chose that because um, in 2020, because we were celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. And so that um, for, in August, we started with um, some beautiful kiosks that were donated to us by the National Archives. And we built um, a whole series of vignettes uh, using mannequins and our period clothing. And we set up scenes within the different buildings, including the main in building, Pioneer House and uh, Schoolhouse, with scenes from the suffrage movement. For instance, you could peek into the parlor and see a suffragette meeting in progress. So what we did um, is we were, the guests were allowed in into the outdoors, but we opened the doors so they could peer into the interiors where we'd set up lots of different things for them to enjoy. And they could still see parts of our collection. Uh, and that was a very successful um, event for us. Um, we needed to find a way to really attract as many visitors as possible on the few days we were able to be open. Uh, if you look at our 2019 visitors here, um, these are some of our major events listed. And we were able in 2019 to of course have all of those. Um, and the, the different colors, I don't know if you can see, they re they're representing adults, seniors, students, and children. So it's giving us an idea of who um, our main visitors are. And the largest category there is adults. Um, we did, uh, we have a little bit different data. So I'm presenting it a little bit differently to you. This is our 2020 visitors, uh, much fewer events. Um, the distribution is still fairly similar. Biggest group is the adults. Um, and then the children. Um, of course, we're not seeing children at school tours here. So that's um, smaller than it would normally be. Uh, we did manage to do one COVID pilot COVID school tour for a homeschool group, and it was very successful, but that was right when COVID really increased in intensity. And so we did not continue in that direction. We decided that we needed to go with more virtual activities. Um, just a quick comparison of our financials, and you'll see complete reports within the two um, books that I sent out to you. Um, you'll see that in 2019, our gross profits were 113,000 roughly, and in 2020, only 62,000. Um, so we're seeing some um, major hit here. Our net revenue was negative 25,000 for the year in 2020. Uh, again, looking at those major sources of income that had been inter interrupted in weddings and school tours is a big piece of that. So how do we recover? Um, we are actually sitting in a pretty good position right now, um, surprisingly. 
Um, what we decided to do was, as I said, bring the museum to the community if they couldn't come to us. And one of the ways that we did that was with virtual tours. Now, there was no direct revenue stream from the virtual tours, but the idea was to stay very connected with the community, make sure people didn't forget us, look to the community for donations and look to keeping our membership loyal and renewing, which we've been successful in doing. We stayed extremely connected during this time. Um, one of those ways was through these, a series of virtual tours. In 2020, we released three, our first three virtual tours. And one of our main videographers um, is sitting here in the room, Nellie Cussworth, um, is the, actually the videographer for our entire virtual tour series. And we have a couple of other series also. Uh, so uh, just for fun, I thought I'd let you step over to the museum for a second or two. And if you went, what, what's your name? Okay, if you wouldn't mind, if we can just play a little clip there from, this is our How to Build a Chumash Op with Fred Nuesca, one of our volunteers. The best we can do on volume. The, yeah, they're just set up to play a small clip, um, but it gives you an idea. The other ones um, on the screen are Welcome to the Timber School and a visit to the Blacksmith Shop. And um, our junior docents, which is a program that we've really revitalized along with our internship program, our junior docents actually lead the tour. Um, if you just want to click on the one with the schoolhouse for just a second, you'll see um, all of our junior docents in costume. And that's been a very successful program for us. Pam's very involved with that program directly. And that's something that we want to grow even more. As we talked about, we want to bring in more and more young people um, and different age groups. And some of you may know that that was rebuilt, that was built actually by the Newberry Park High School, along with, of course, some expert help. Um, and then our last one is the Blacksmith Shop. And this is one of our most um, popular exhibits. Um, so this is why we chose these three as our first virtual tours, so that we can have people wanting to come back as soon as we're open. And um, we have had good attendance when we've been able to be open. You can go ahead and pause that. Um, in, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Can you? There we go. There we go. Okay. So <laughs> make you all crazy here. So in in 2021, um, we put out another four virtual tours. So we have a total of seven virtual tours, um, bringing our guests into all of our uh, major outlying buildings. Uh, so that's been an exciting thing for us to have those as an outreach. And we've sent those out uh, through our stage lines newsletter, which goes to our membership and a few community members beyond that, as well as through constant contact and passport to history cooperative group that we work with. And um, so we're reaching out to a large group of people with these virtual tours. And then of course they're on YouTube as well as on our website. So people can search and find them. And I've been interested to see comments and find that people you were starting to attract audiences that are not necessarily anywhere near living in the area. Um, okay, so that's going to do that for me. I'm trying. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've offered a series of grand porch performances. So when we are able to be open, we want to make sure there's something that we're really promoting in the papers and um, in the community that people will come out to the inn for, that they won't say, oh, well, I'll go there next week or the next week. It's, you know, this show is being offered this weekend and this weekend only, or maybe two weekends, so come now. Uh, this was a very successful show, The Ladies of the Conejo, where we focused on eight prominent women from the Conejo speaking in an old time radio show format. And um, they were not all living at the same time. They were starting from the Spanish land grant days and coming up to Donna Fargo here um, with Conejo Valley days. And so um, you had to uh, escape reality a little bit, but we brought all these historical figures in and brought history alive for our guests. And this uh, was first introduced during our holiday event um, 
And that was, we were allowed to do one performance before we were shut down. So we had a very elaborate holidays at the end event. Um, we were completely sold out for the first evening of the event and we extended it to a second weekend and that was selling out well too. As it turned out though, we were only able to uh, host that event for one weekend before the governor's order shut down all the museums. So I'm hoping I can go, yeah, okay. Um, this is a, our 2021 porch performance, grand porch performance. This is Come Sip With Me. And uh, this was on May 1st and 15th, so fairly recent. Uh, we had about 100 guests at our per second performance, uh, which is good for a Saturday. We've only been able to open on Saturdays um, from one to four. We're normally open from Wednesday through Sunday, one to four, but between, um, uh, docents who are not quite ready to return. We're getting more that are willing now, um, but we've had a, a difficulty in staffing enough for more days open. So what we've done is focused on making the days that we are open very attractive to guests and trying to bring in a grid group of people. Um, this is our, our Heritage Oak fundraising campaign. Uh, this was started, uh, it was planned before 2021 because we'd been advised by CRPD that we were going to need to remove the ancient oak tree on our property. And while that was very sad for us, we've turned this into a really great opportunity for growth um, and kind of looking at the circle of life. This is a series of videos that have been produced in conjunction with that campaign. Um, and on the left, you see our beautiful oak tree there. And one of our docents talks about the oak tree and the importance to the Chumash and to our community. In the center, you see Alan Salazar, who came out to give a blessing on the oak tree the day that we were um, cutting it down. And um, if I can, I'm actually going to try and play this third one. OK. Um, so if you can pause the first two. The third one is showing our removal of the oak tree and time-lapse photography. And that same day, we also, you, can you turn down the volume a little bit? Um, that same day, we also planted a new oak tree, uh, a young oak tree, it was 40 years young. And so that whole um, area, we're calling that the Heritage Oak Grove. And in that area, we have a, um, a beautiful meter where we're, um, we have a goal set of raising $25,000. And that's a magic number. You know why it's $25,000, of course, because we're hoping to raise matching uh, funds to be matched by CRPD for not only development of that oak grove, where we have slices of the original tree and are wanting to put together a timeline project showing key events in our local history on the giant slabs of oak. So we're working with a dendrologist to date the oak tree and establish the rings within it. Um, we also used uh, many parts of that oak tree to put in some rustic seating in that area and also to make some beautiful craft items, everything from wine racks to candle holders and planters, which we're selling in our emporium. Uh, that's our gift shop. And so um, there's lots of ways that we're using that uh, difficult change of letting go of our oak tree, but to look at how we can use it to grow. And in fact, that's, that's our campaign with the Heritage Oak series is who says money doesn't grow on trees. Um, your $1 can become three with, in cooperation with uh, Kaneho Recreation and Parks District. So we are hoping to, to reach that goal um, and work with you in making some of the property improvements that we had planned. Um, one of the big areas that we're focusing on is patio developments. This area in the Heritage Oak Grove is one patio area, a back deck peria, patio and our lower patio area. And the idea is to have these be multi-use areas where we can put on different types of events and also where we can attract visitors to stay and linger a little while when they come. Uh, we find that because we don't offer refreshments or um, we obviously do have bathrooms, but after about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes, most of our guests are leaving the property. Um, and so we're looking for ways to help them come and stay a while and maybe come on days where they're not even gonna do the museum tours, but just wanna enjoy the beautiful grounds, walk the nature trail, have some refreshments on the back porch um, and that sort of thing. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to diversify our activities. Um, this is looking forward to 2021. 
Uh, we're in the midst of our spring Conejo hunt, which has been an extremely popular activity. Again, the idea here was to attract people to the property. And one of the mottos we've had is trying to make the inn, the museum, the place to be for the holidays and the place for making memories. And so um, for the spring holiday, uh, we introduced the spring Conejo hunt. And in this event, um, guests are able to look for cute little Conejos, bunnies all over the property. We have 36 of them. Um, they're metal works, beautiful, um, made by one of our volunteers. And they're numbered and the guests can write down where they found the Conejos and get a small prize at the end. And this was introduced at Easter um, and it was so popular. People were already asking us if they would be doing it next year. We decided to just extend it throughout spring. And so every Saturday people are still hunting Conejos and I'll tell you the adults like it as much as the kids. Um, also coming up is our uh, kind of our signature event, the Pioneer Jamboree. Um, that'll be coming up on June 12th, and we're excited to get back to doing this. Of course, we've had to modify it a little because here we are opening this event up just a few days before things are supposed to loosen up uh, a little more. Um, so we're still requiring masks on property and um, social distancing and limiting the number of guests. Um, we are doing quite well with ticket sales for that, uh, which are, we are requiring pre-purchase. And so we're um, very eager to get back to our Pioneer Jamboree event. And um, I wanna thank CRPD for all the support you've given us. And this is our Heritage Oak Grove area. As you can see, the, um, the seating there is all made from pieces of the tree. And it's actually a very lovely little area um, that we'll be using for weddings and um, just social areas. I've been e I interested to see how the guests use it when they come. And um, we have incorporated it into our recent Come Sip With Me program, a uh, performance on the Grand Perch that was about how to drink tree tea properly. And we have little tea tables set up up there and Pam and I got to be special guests, but not as special as the main guest who showed up, which was the queen herself. So if the queen's willing to come out to Sim and see what we have to offer, we hope all of you will be too. And thank you again so much for your support. Thank you. <laughs> Director Lang, any questions or comments? Yes. Um, again, great uh, presentation, uh, a lot of good information and so forth. And my connection goes back many, many, many years and I have a uh, not personal, but my mother-in-law um, worked in the kitchen. And when the stove first arrived, she was the one cleaning it up and so forth. So that goes back many years. And But anyway, um, you mentioned the Heritage Oak area. Tom, uh, is the Park District involved in any aspects of the design of that? And if so, are there any renderings yet as to you, you talked about a wedding venue, et cetera, et cetera. What's it gonna look like? So um, we're in the very early stages of it. The main use of it right now is for the fundraising purposes. Um, as I mentioned, we have this beautiful um, meter where we're marking off as we raise money. Uh, it has an oak tree carved at the top of it that um, was made by Bobby Messinger, our metalworks docent. And um, so that's the focus right now is to bring people into the area um, let them know that what we're looking at doing and that we're raising funds to develop that area as well as other parts of the property. Um, what we want it to be is a multi-use multi area. Um, weddings is one of the areas. Um, there have been some um, proposals to put a gazebo in that area. Oh, cool. um, a gazebo. Oh, gazebo. Yeah, um, a, a lot of people, including myself, think a gazebo would be perfect. Other alternatives that are being discussed are to um, be able to bring up portable arches and things like that for the wedding um, area. It, it used to have, we used to have many weddings performed in front of the oak tree that was there before, but it's still a lovely area. And so um, an archway could be brought up and then we could um, still use it for other things. One of the other things that's been discussed is um, we're looking at, as you can see it, doing a lot more theater. We've done the Grand Porch performances. Um, so we're looking at doing a lot of living history performances. And one thing that's been proposed is a, I'll call it a, a reverse theater in the round where the guests are sitting in our central parking lot 
and they kind of turn to see action in different areas, action on the front porch, action in, at the uh, blacksmith shop, action going on over by the schoolhouse. Uh, and this oak tree area would be also a stage area for those performances. Um, so we wanna keep it rustic in nature if we're gonna use it as a multi-use area, uh, but probably some sort of a surface, it's just dirt right now, um, and probably accessible by a set of stairs. Right now you have to go around back and there's a small set of stairs, but we'd like to bring them from the front area so that um, if it is used for weddings or if there's a gazebo there, it's easy to get back and forth. Thank you, sounds good. Director Cusworth. So, so I know a lot about the stagecoach. <laughs> um, Rose, uh, video tour done. I'll get it to you soon. It's really good. Oh, good. In well, fact, I enjoyed that one because when I filmed all the other ones, I pretty much knew all the information. But um, when Jeannie, the president of the Rose Society, was telling me all about these antique roses, I knew nothing. So I felt like I learned something. So I'm very excited about this video. And it's gorgeous but, um, right now. It smells good. I wish we could put that in the video. <laughs> yeah, well, she brings that up. She even has me smell it. All of a sudden, the camera goes up and you <laughs> smell the roses. She's, she has a lot of energy. Um, you, can, you can tell that Jana's brought a lot of energy into the Stagecoach Inn and all of those activities that, that I think a lot of them were her idea, and I, I'm sure other people too. Um, have been huge successes. We bought one of those Caneos for our house and my son wanted one and my granddaughter wanted one. So I bought three of those metal Caneos to put in our yards. So, um, and the trick or treat thing, I um, my grandkids have moved here. So I've been going to events through the eyes of my grandchildren and uh, it's been a joy to me to be able to share that with them. So I think we're looking for better days ahead. Thank you so much, Jana. And then, you know, also Pam, I don't know how Pam does it. She's a full-time teacher and I wouldn't be doing her job mm -hmm. as president mm -hmm. of the society, but she, uh, she leads us all with a smile and we're all staying together. So thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Director Holt. Well, as Pam knows, I, <laughs> I did a lot at the Stagecoach Inn Museum, and of course, I still get the newsletter, which I, I really love to read, find out what's going on. Your presentation, however, was great. I found out more things about what's going on there. And um, so I just, uh, I think there's a lot happening, and congratulations to both of you. And it's good to see you, Pam. <laughs> I have to congratulate both museums uh, because now you're working together. And there was a time, you know, I was so involved for so long, there was a total separation. And now there is not. And um, I think that's just fantastic. Well, I think that as a community, we all need to work together. Right. Um, and, and like I said, when I was in Europe, and I saw all the museums in New York working together, I thought, yes. This is what we need. This is what we should do. So, um, it was interesting during COVID that um, the museums were the California Association of Museums and, and the National Associations as well, of course, came together looking for funding. 
And so I had much more interaction with the other museums than I expected to. Um, and so that was a big plus. And I did, I failed to mention that um, we were successful um, in attracting uh, and, and being awarded several relief grants so that um, we actually, if you're looking at the current financials, which is the, the separate sheet that I handed out, um, we're actually sitting in a, a, a comfortable position. Um, we were able to bring in two paycheck protection program loan, uh, forgivable loans, as well as a COVID relief grant and a uh, Ventura County business um, assistance grant. So those totaled about $33,000. And so that went a long way in helping offset some of the lost revenues. So we are actually in what I would call a stable position. Um, we have been able to cover a lot of our operations and like the Chumash Museum, we really reduced our expenses, but we're looking to CRPD to help us stay on track with our growth and development plans because um, you know, we took everything we could do to just keep the lights on, so to speak, and keep things going. Um, and we have some fantastic plans for how we're going to use the property, and that's where we're looking for your assistance. Well, and honestly, you guys, um, our air conditioning, heating, and air completely broke during COVID. What a great time for that to happen! <laughs> so um, we actually were able to rebuild it with, uh, with your help, and uh, and and now we have the museum quality air uh, heating and air. That we never had before, so that our archives are safe. And so, I mean, yes, our, when we had the uh, suffer, suffragette exhibit and uh, all the doors were open, well, it was okay because our meeting in Airbag was dead. <laughs> <laughs> that was completely gone. <laughs> and, and the minute it got fixed, it was like, those doors are closed. <laughs> That was an important, um, I think, development for us because, of course, um, we have a, an older generation of docents, um, a higher risk category. And uh, as I said before, a lot of people hesitant to come back. And I think with the guests, too, guests were eager to come back to the outdoor facility, but people hesitate sometimes going into the clothes, especially an older building. You kind of think, hmm, what's the air quality like? And, uh, is there air exchange? Well, there is great air exchange now, as Pam said. So we feel very comfortable in bringing guests back into the museum, and we feel very comfortable working there closely together. Director Hopper, did you have any questions or comments? Just a comment. Might the, pretty much the same comment I, I made with our uh, first presentation, that I'm so impressed by what you and, and your volunteers and everyone have, have been doing during this challenging period and not just sitting and hoping and waiting and well things will be better next year but you're making things better now so that when you're able to resume some semblance of normalcy you'll, you'll be up and running so um congratulations to to everything you've done for the past year uh, a great presentation and um I look forward to being able to get back there again. I'm just, I'm sorry I'm going to miss the, the Jamboree. I'm out of town that Saturday, but um, yeah. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that they're about. Oh, thank you. And I just want to echo that too, just to hear and see the uh, different activities we've been able to take on during the uh, opportunity to do so uh, has been very encouraging because yeah, you could have just closed the doors and turned lights off and say, okay, we'll put the, uh, put the little uh, mothballs out for a while until we come back and you know, we'll start over again. But to continue to see your efforts is great because I, I mean, obviously to have these, both these facilities in our own community is wonderful. Because uh, history makes a difference for us, you know. It's like they say, history matters. You you need to know what your history is, uh, and 
people don't realize how valuable it is until they learn about their history. So appreciate your continuing to make that not only available, but alive, you know, it, it, including just coming that way. You know, I'm going to start using that term now when my kids say my clothes are old. I said, no, I'm wearing period clothing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. Did you have another thing, Director Hubbard? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for the presentation, uh, both from the Chumash and the uh, Historical Society. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Look forward to it all the time because you guys, you know, there's no dust at these places. Things are happening all the time. So thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Okay, continuing with our agenda. Items from the public. Do we have anybody waiting to address the board on? Uh, okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, in that case, I we. Have... Okay, she's probably waiting for the items. Is she uh, online right now? Okay, we can just uh, check, we'll check with her, see if she was wanting. Lisa, yeah, can she hear us or? Oh, Barbara, this is Doug Nichols. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We, we, we're we at the point in our agenda for items for the public, and I just didn't want to pass by that without giving you the opportunity to speak now or if you wanted to wait till later in the agenda. No, that's okay. I didn't sign up to speak at all, actually. I just showed up to see if anybody else was going to speak. So. Oh, okay. All right. I'm good. All right. Thank you. We will feel free to listen in. I will. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to item five, approval of the agenda. Do I have any motion to approve the agenda or any modifications? Director Huffer? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll pass that. All right, next we have our consent calendar, items A and B. We have a uh, motion to approve or any concerns to express of either of those items? Director Cusworth? Uh, I'll move to approve the consent calendar, A and B. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That carries as well. All right. Uh, deferred matters. We have a public hearing. Preliminary budget fiscal years 2021-22 and 2022-23. Right. Do we have... A presentation to go along this public hearing. So we do. Do we need to open the public hearing? Yes, we got to open it. Yes, I'll officially open okay. the public hearing. <laughs> Thank you. All 
right, so Gabby's gonna put up my lovely presentation. Um, and it's my first year doing a two-year budget, which I love that we do two-year budgets, by the way, so thank you, but please be patient with me for my first one. Um, first and foremost, I already found a typo. <laughs> um, actually, Tim did. It's in the equipment list. The second column is year two, and it's just mislabeled, so none of the data is wrong. It's just that it will be corrected in the final version. Um, the other thing is in looking in the previous two-year budgets, we typically show the data um, of the last two-year budget, which I did, but I also gave you an additional year because I wanted to give you a comparison with no COVID impact, so I wanted to give you an extra year so you could see what a normal year would be like when you were making comparisons. So that's just a note before we go forward in that. Um, so the, the, the budget process to your budget, we get input from all the different divisions and we meet with all the work centers to see what's going on and we make sure our revenues and expenses are balanced. Pretty standard. The assumptions and highlights, um, there's a lot of details in your packet and feel free to cut me off and interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, so I just wanted to draw the kind of bigger pictures and highlight some key points for you all. Our property tax revenues, we're assuming a 2% increase every year. Uh, we know the minimum wage is going to be at $15 an hour come January. So we budgeted not only for that change, but also to allow for um, some increases to address potential compaction from that raise. Our PERS contributions are increasing as well. There's, um, I'll go into a little more detail on that because it's rather dramatic and I'm sure the board is already aware. And we're assuming that the recreation revenues that we had dipped because of COVID are gonna be coming back. And we also have increases in uh, full-time positions that we're gonna be talking about later tonight as well. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Yep. So, Challenges, I think COVID's an obvious one. <laughs> um, pension funding, minimum wage, insurance costs and aging infrastructure and the general plan update. Um, I think the board's pretty aware of all of those issues. I did wanna mention the insurance costs. We did um, budget for some increase in insurance costs and Jim might be able to give more information on it as well. But if there is another bad fire season, it's expected that some fire insurance won't even be available next year. So. Um, that might not be a budget issue, that's a whole other <laughs> thing, and it'll become probably something like the earthquake authority that the state has, is how that'll get treated. Um, regarding COVID-19 relief, my narrative in the budget document was kind of therapeutic for me to explain all the different <laughs> avenues we could have gotten money but didn't. Um, you saw the letter from the senator and the assemblywoman um, that came out, I think, yesterday or today. We'll see, None. there's no assumption of getting any COVID relief in this budget. I'd be happy to change it if we did it, <laughs> but it's not in the, in the budget right now. Um, so I wanted to explain the assumed re recovery, of a rec uh, recovery of our recreation revenues. Um, so this is a sample work center um, participation and classes tracking that uh, REC has been doing for, I think you've been perfecting it um, over the last couple years. It's included in every single work center packet in your budget packet, but I just wanted to show the example. So the columns are the number of participants that um, went through that work center and the line is the um, number of classes. And so you can kind of see it's creating this V or U shape because of COVID. So we're kind of doing our revenues in the same way. We're assuming we're gonna have that gradual incline the same way that our participants and classes are coming back. So next year, we're assuming we'll get to be a little bit better than right now, but not all the way back to where we were pre-COVID. And then we're pretty close to where we were pre-COVID um, with the second year of the budget. I'm sorry, so that, Melissa, Melissa, could you, oh, sure. could you explain again the the blue line above the green bars, you say those were the classes? Yes, so it's the number of classes that were held at that center. It's okay. The blue line and then the green columns are the number of participants. Participants, okay. All right, thank you. Yep. So that's kind of our assumptions um, for the COVID-19 impacted revenues. Also, it's not just rec, it's also like just the rents and things like that. So 
We're hoping to get back to the pre-COVID levels by 1819, that we're from 1819 by the time this, this budget's over. Now this, I think you all have seen this graph before, probably from Cheryl, and so we updated it with current numbers. So this is the percent of each employee's salary that CRPD has to contribute to CalPERS. So you can see a few years ago, it was substantially lower. And then this year it's getting up to almost 25%, but it is gonna start to ebb. And actually the last year in 26, 27, it goes down a little bit. <laughs> so we're hitting the peak, but you can see the dramatic incline that, that um, CRPD has had to absorb um, through that time. So I was gonna give some district-wide snapshots um, this is the revenue picture. The first year, the big orange one that's substantially different is for the capital program that uh, Tom and Andrew discussed last time. It's the carryovers and the fund balance that's being used for the capital projects. Um, and if you remember last time, year one was very, very big and year two went down. So that's the primary difference between the two budget years. The expenditures by fund, you're going to see the same thing. The capital projects is the big one. And you'll also see um, that the general fund is still the majority of the, of the budget and then the district wide assessment, equipment, capital projects, all those are in there. And then here is the general fund revenues history. So um, it's kind of difficult to show because it looks for a second like COVID didn't impact us. So I made the little yellow part on the top is from the SoCal Edison settlement. So you can actually see our revenue went down last year because of COVID and that Edison settlement is just completely separate. So I wanted to make sure that wasn't confusing. And so we're projecting that we're gonna keep on that kind of trend by the end of the year, but kind of go back up to it. So hopefully it makes sense. And a similar thing for the general fund uh, expenditures, we reduced it in 1920, we reduced, we reduced further this year and then we did that inner fund loan. Um, and then next year, we've got the proposed budgets um, for the next two years going forward. This was a uh, revenue by type. So the blue is the property taxes. The red is the recreation revenue and the gray is other. You'll see again in 1920, the so-called Edison settlement is in the other category. So mm. there's a spike there. Yep. Um, and then you'll see the red amounts drop um, and then they're slowly um, going back up. And this is that breakdown for the two proposed years. The biggest change here is rec revenue is going to change from about 3.6 to 4.5. Hopefully, you can blame Tim if it doesn't work. <laughs> and then these are the expenses by division. And um, again, you're going to see that the recreation one is the one that changes the most between the years because it's going along with that revenue assumption. Most of general fund is um, the salaries. There are also services and supplies and a tiny bit of capital outlay um, that are, and all the details are in your packet as well. So this is the district-wide assessment district budget, mostly capital improvements. Again, for Dos Fiantos. and Rancho Caneo. And so for the next steps for this, we will integrate um, your feedback. If you have any questions or comments tonight and then um, any changes we identify with the capital budget, any carryovers we might need, although Andrew already told me no, um, I won't hold you to it. But um, we'll come back uh, at the next board meeting with the final version. So I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Melissa. We'll start to my left with Director Huffer, if you have any questions or comments. I've got a number and they may not all be in, in perfectly logical order. Some sure. of them are gonna be, as I go through the package, because there was a lot of stuff there. Um, you, meant, you mentioned that uh, the, the biggest single expenditure item for the district um, are uh, employee expenses, which is obvious, but um, one of the, 
the impact factors that you mentioned was the increase in minimum wage, but of the total expenditures for um, employee expenses, do you have a feel for what percentage of that is Can we people go back who are number? at minimum wage? So the salaries and benefits number for year one um, is 14.8. And the minimum wage adjustment we calculated was about 150,000. So, 150,000. Okay. <laughs> does that help? Yeah, it <laughs> okay. does. It does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the recreation revenue and expenses. Um, you know, there, there's no way of knowing right. where recreation is going to be over the you know for the 20 for the 21 22 budget cycle, I guess my sort of initial reaction is people are going to be so anxious to get back to things that it may not get right back to, to where it was pre-COVID, but it seems to me that your assumptions for, for recreation revenue were pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. If the revenues, if the interest in classes uh, goes faster than expected, would it be safe to assume that recreation expenditures would also have to increase along with the revenue increases in, in recreation? Um, probably, and I'll let Tim chime in on that too, but we would also come back to you, like we did um, with the aquatics this year where they were outperforming on their revenue side and wanted to increase the expense, so we would probably talk to, to rec and figure out what that recommendation would be. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and we are optimistic on on uh, our revenues increasing. We're seeing registration going pretty good for summer already. And we have gotten the vibe that people are excited, ready to go back, specifically at like Global Center. They're pounding at the door, calling every day. So, um, and one of the things with, I've been on some uh, Zoom calls with just cities throughout California. And one thing I think that will help us is that we've been open the entire time in the public eye where a lot of other agencies have not been. So they're gonna struggle, I think, getting people back in the door where I think we'll we'll have a, a lot more success getting people to return to those programs. So um, our staff also do a really good job of staying within their expenditures. Um, but I think if it comes to a point where we're hitting the mark um, and we're sh showing the offset in our revenues that like Melissa said, we'd come back to the board. So do we do we have the flexibility that if demand picks up quicker than expected, that we would be able to meet some of the, at least meet some of that additional demand? Yeah, we, we'll always do our best. We're hiring right now, um, and hiring's been a little bit challenging, but we're doing doing good for the summer. And then a lot of these classes too that bring in revenue are are uh, percentage contractor, so we can always bring more of them on or uh, increase their class uh, numbers as well. So once a session has started, it's a little bit more difficult, but if we have a really good summer, um, you know, we'll just plan on having more classes um, in the fall. Okay. Um, sort of a random question, but you mentioned, or one of you mentioned the products, and it, I was curious, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, the number isn't that huge, but in the, Recreation revenue it's on P5 or page 43 of our packet. For some reason, uh, the community pool at CLU, the amended budget for 2021 was 284, and the estimated actual is 730. Yeah. yeah. How did that happen? We, we increased the, so I don't think this was the increased budget that we just did two weeks ago. So there, we amended it for another hundred, I think 30,000, but no, they completely outperformed. Yeah, but I mean, that's even look at pre-COVID. Yep. They, a huge increase over pre-COVID. There were a couple things with that. They, they really, um, with some of the COVID restrictions, they had to uh, use the racquetball system for um, rec or lap swim. And so they did generate a lot of money from from lap swim, and also they were able to utilize the pool, um, the Cal, what's the Cal Lutheran pool next door. They were able to utilize that one a lot more. 
for their programming than they would during a normal year when the school would be using it more. So they actually kind of had, uh, they had a great year because they were never closed, constantly busy because they were one of the only things that was open initially. And then they had use of the other pool as well. And, and I may say that cooperative relationship with CLU is critical because we like du du more than doubled the surface water we could use because CLU basically said, sure, we're not using our pool, go ahead. And so that with all the lap swimming, you could just put people in the big pool. And... So maybe we need another pool. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. But, uh, I'm just curious, do you expect that to continue with, or is that just like an anomaly as with just going with the pandemic? Uh, I don't anticipate it will continue moving forward. Um, Dee's Dee, very good at working relationships with them. So if there's opportunities, she'll seek it. Um, but we will be back on the school campuses this summer. Um, I think both, maybe just one, but so we'll have some additional um, programming at the high schools as well. Sure. All right, thank you. Okay, um, on page P19, and maybe I answer the question later on, but there seemed to be a, a pretty substantial increase in the, the total budget for parks and planning. Um, oh, I, okay, and there was, is, is most of that increase from say pre-COVID of a little over 9 million to over 10 million? And I guess, Tom, this would be a question for you, is, is most of that increase due to the four new employees, the, the Costco Rangers, and then the, the four new Costco staff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, and then another totally random question. Sure. What the heck is an annual fertigation tank? I... <laughs> Anybody? I'll ask any of you. I have no. That so the you know, just just the combination of fertilizer and irrigation. Think of it that way. So it's a mm -hmm. tank that goes immediately into the irrigation, a fertilizing system that goes immediately into the irrigation system, rather than the guys doing it uh, manually. Okay. I just I caught my never seen that sure. term before. So yeah. learn something new tonight. Yes. All right. I think. I know I had a few other items that were served. Let me just take a quick. Sure, I gave you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was really impressed by by the, the, the capital outlay for the for the recreation. Somebody said, I mean, that long, long list of individual items. Someone spent an awful lot of time putting all those together. So that was like is, a, is that, a is two that year process. Here, as opposed to the, the Rochelle. That, <laughs> no. Okay. I guess. There really weren't any other major questions. I just, I'm, I'm really impressed by you know all the the, the data put together by all three divisions and, and the way you brought that all together, Melissa. So kudos and, and thank you for all the work that everyone did. Thank you. Thank you, Director Holt. I, I have no other questions. Thank you, Director Cussworth. Yeah, I'm blown away. It was very impressive Thank you. Uh, presentation. So I, I knew what that was. <laughs> <laughs> you should have just asked I, I, me. Yeah. I, I mean, I knew all about it. So. Of course, of course. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Director Lang. Yes, the one item that uh, Director Hufford touched on is the COU pool, the aquatics, and uh, that is you know, very impressive, and it says a lot for that specific group, you know, of our rec division. And uh, Dee and the whole team are to be congratulated. And, uh, I just look forward to a, a better year, for sure. And uh, I know the whole team is working towards that goal. So, and Melissa, thank you so much for a great package. Go ahead, General Anger. Uh, Mr. Creel, go ahead. Well, I, uh, I, I, uh, I forgot, Chair Nichols, that you still had to say a few things, but I did okay. want to, so I had the sense we were wrapping, but the, uh, I didn't want this to sort of go forward without specifically mentioning all of Melissa's very hard work and then her narrative, you know, the message that, that she worked on and she called it a cathartic 
experience describing <laughs> the all the woulda, coulda, shouldas with the different COVID relief opportunities that we didn't have access to. Um, and so um, one thing I did notice in looking at, at the state budget much more closely, because normally we just don't really have that much going on with the state you know we're pretty we're pretty independent locally funded you know we're not really relying heavily on state or federal you know grant monies or or programmatic monies because so much money frankly is sloshing around in government at the federal and state level um and in looking at that i i may between now and the next budget when you bring this back ask for a little bit more money um I'm not sure how much because I got to do a little research, but I think we may be well served to have a like a contracts grant um, grant finding organization, um, like a consultant um, that knows how to find and and write good grant proposals. Because if we're not getting COVID relief money, we got to go find the pools and the pots of grant money that that the feds and the state might be making available because there is so much money right now and so um just i wanted to make a note of that so i'm going to do a little research over the next week find out what firms kind of maybe can do contract-based grant work because i don't think we're ready to hire a, a staff person to be a grant writer which many organizations have those but um but i think at least in the next couple years we might be well served by having somebody in 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 our corner looking and trying to write and obtain some of the grant programs that are out there. So these are tangential things, maybe not our core business, but there's a whole lot of like energy based grants. So more solar or electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations, um, those kinds of things, um, tons of money in that um, emergency service related projects. So to the extent we can obtain grant money for that we might go after it so so i i just kind of wanted to throw that out there so um because that's just all happened in the last week really since the budget this staff report's been written so just want to brace you for that i might i might come back with a little bit more um probably in the management services area to, to hire a grants administration firm if, if we can find something that sounds reasonable that's all and I apologize because I thought no, I, was, okay. I thought you had already wrapped. Your All part of the up. same discussion, no okay. problem whatsoever. Thank you for adding that. Nichols. Yes, go ahead, Director Harper. Come across one other comment yes. that I, I wanted go ahead. to make. Go ahead. Actually, two short ones with with Mr. Friedel talking about the, the grants and although the number is much smaller, I would have to admit I was a little envious of both of our presenters that they were able to get some kind of COVID relief funds. <laughs> we couldn't yeah. get anything, so. Um, but the other comment I wanted to make on um, page P55, specifically referring to the uh, Rancho Canal uh, budget summary, and I'm, I'm sure everyone is aware of this, but just pointing out that the revenue from the assessments only represents about one third of the total revenues that are have been expended and, and are budgeted to be expended uh, with the other two thirds coming from transfers in, which I assume was the transfers in from the general fund. Correct. So I just, I wanted to point that out and make that comment. Yeah. Thank you. Chair Nicholas. Yes. Before I lose this train of thought, Please in reference ahead. to the comments that the general manager is making about potential grants out there and so forth is, um, California Association of Rec and Park Districts, um, do they have any type of information in that category, you know, that other park districts kind of go to or consultants or whatever? Um, not, you know, um, I, I believe that as we, you know, all get together and do like the annual meeting and that kind of stuff, there, there. If if people know of state grant programs that are available for record parks, or people are finding success in, people share and talk about that, and and people. So, so I would tend to hear about it. But right now, because the budget's not even finalized yet, and you're just reading that these big chunks of money are landing in these various state accounts, you, 
just knowing how the state works, you know that there will be grant programs established to get the money dispersed in areas they need to spend it. And I'm trying to get a little ahead of that and have somebody thinking about, you know, our ability to write grants to get in the queue for some of that money now. Um, because unlike many of the agencies that just got a check handed to them because of COVID, we're, it looks like our best shot might end up being seeking grant funding, you know, but we'll see. So. Any feel as far as um, Henry and Jackie, is there? Well, um, and an excellent development is the letter that we handed out and they are clearly going to bat for us. But, you know, in, in all candor, you know, um, although there's 90 rec and park districts throughout the state, we're one of the larger ones. Um, you know, we're certainly in the top five. And once you hit the top, after the top 10, they're like million dollar and less organizations. So they're really dinky little places all up and down the state. And for example, LA County with it's 10 million people and all its legislators doesn't have a rec and park district. So right. those legislators and senators, and when we yeah. complain about rec and park districts not having money, they're like, they, what's a rec and park district and why would I care? to them. So it's it's an issue, you know? And so as hard as Jackie and, and you know, um, Assembly Member Irwin and, and Senator Stern will be working on our behalf, have been, it, it, it it's a hard thing. So I did share that, uh, that there is a pot of $100 million that has been made available to special districts specifically for COVID, and that is generic special district. So my follow up on that, there's no more clearer guidance than than kind of what you guys have seen in that. So $100 million for special districts, there really isn't the language drafted yet for how that gets distributed. So even those giant behemoth water districts, transportation districts, waste, you know, wastewater districts, they can still seek money out of that pot, not just yeah. the ones that were already excluded. So we're competing with 3000 other agencies for a pot of 100 million. So it's not really that much money, to be honest. And then there is 250 million in there for local parks that got added in. Now, when I say added in, these are the legislators proposal back to the governor. So this all has to turn into some deal that gets made and final budget approved in the next two weeks. But even that 250 million, I'm being told by our consultant that either the 100 million pot, the 250 million dollar pot, or both are going to have the, or very likely to have the language about, you know, economically um, you disadvantaged. Know, disadvantaged and critically underserved communities. So, so you have to be both economically disadvantaged, so a, a, a low income area, combined with a critically underserved area, meaning no parks or green open space area within a half mile radius of like where you want to spend it or serve is kind of how it works. So it's hard to complain about it, but we have not many underserved, you know, economically yeah. disadvantaged. And we also are lucky to have a lot of open space. So the open space, you know, hits almost every little half mile you draw. So we end up faring poorly in state grant programmatic distribution of money. So thank you for that information. Yes, thank you for very much because I know it's a, an ongoing challenge. A, a couple of questions. Oh, actually, first an observation on the revenue summary, P4 or page 42 and P5 and page 43. This was looking at the recreation revenue. Again, this is more of an observation where I've seen the, the centers in particular, the, the uh, teen center, orchard, canal center, uh, and even the community pool, going through the series of, of years that you provided, Melissa, and thank you for going through that. But I just continue to see that the uh, orchard center just continues to be like towards the top is when it compares to other centers. I'm just curious, you know, what is it about the orchard center that generates all the activity and is it just is it that community around them that, that participate yeah. more is it uh that they have more facilities that they're able to offer more uh so tim doer by the way welcome thank you for joining us tonight you know if you 
if you have any magical insights as to what why that center is, it always seems to do so well, I'd love to love to hear about. It. Sure, I think it's a a few things. Um, and Kurt Gunning's the supervisor there. He's done a good job over the last few years raising revenue. I think one thing or a few things. I'll start with the building itself. I think the way it's designed compared to some of the other facilities, it has more opportunity there. There's more classroom spaces. He also has a full size gym there, which some of the other ones do as well. But He's able to do more in, inside programming there. So he's done really well with that. He's also, he also does really, or that community center does really well with, with rentals. They have lots of birthday parties and, and meetings over there. It's also just a very busy happening community center with the high school being right there and, and all the ball fields. So there's always people on property. And I think that helps him get people into the programs. He's done a really good job or the, the community center has done a really good job with their feeder program. So they have the, the preschool and the pre-K program. And then they roll that into, um, they have a class called Miss Tia's um, class and Miss Suzanne, which is like once they're after that age, or, or no, sorry, that they're before that age. So they, they just all kind of feed into their programs there. So once they have them young, they stay in there for a while. Um, and uh, he's just been able to continue that over the last, last few years. So a, a combination of all of that, but uh, they're just always busting at the seams over at that center. Mm -hmm. Well, good for them. Glad to hear it. Inspector Holt? I would say also the uh, location, because that's Newbury Park. And I think um, uh, that's where more people would go to that particular place. In Thousand Oaks, you have other, you know, more venues mm -hmm. to choose from. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of the reasons, too. That Please. It could it could be, and one of the things I also forgot to mention is the skate park um, is there as well, and and that's just especially this the last skate, year yeah. has been just booming. Yeah. Well, glad. I mean, it's, it's always I'm just kind of curious because you know, we have so many different centers, and and some of them offer unique opportunities, but many of them offer similar opportunities. Just curious as to the whether it's demographics or whatever it happens to be. Director Lang. Yes, I was going to see. I think you kind of mentioned Nate, uh, Newberry Park. But the neighborhood, I think, is more involved in recreation and park. And you see the following uh, that they have for the 4th of July for the pancake breakfast, the uh, home run derby, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's something inherent into that uh, part of our community in, in uh, Caneo Valley, too. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, that. Uh... I'm looking at page P7, uh, page 45 in the packet. Down at the bottom, you have a bar chart. And the second bar says 2019 to 2020 actual. It's the only bar there that has a fund balance at the top of that. Can you explain what that came from? So that is the Edison settlement money that, oh, that we is. received okay. and that we were keeping in fund balance to be used in future years. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Another dog ears here. Okay. And then I'm on page uh, P17 or page 55 in the packet. And then uh, I see capital outlay at the top of 2018 29, just a little sliver up there. But again, no, nowhere else in any of the others. I'm curious as to why that is there. I'm trying to remember the 1300 from 2018. It's so small. Yeah, I mean, somebody needed an office chair or something. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Big, big $1,300. So yeah. Capital outlay. <laughs> yeah, is that, I mean, it doesn't even seem enough to be capital outlay. Yeah, well, if you look down in the, the numbers right below that, 2018-19 uh, actual capital outlay, 1,308. That was yep. the, the only year where they had a capital outlay. That's what it kind of seems strange to me. Well, why, that's what he's asking. Why yeah, only that it says, year? It says replace office equipment. That's what it has. Yeah. Yeah, literally, it could be like literally a couple chairs. chairs. Okay. Like okay. Because, well, yeah, because management services, I guess, is not always a whole lot of capital outlay, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so what else did I have here? I think those are the only questions. I think everything else is pretty straightforward. I, uh, with the magic that you've done in anticipating revenue uh, expenditures for the next couple of years. 
I'm not going to ask you to put a, a percentage of how close you think you're going to get to being exactly right on. <laughs> but uh, what, what I'd like to suggest is perhaps uh, having some routine updates, especially as we kind of start getting into what I hope is a ramping up process into this next thing, you know, where I don't know if it's it doesn't have to be every meeting, but I don't know if it's, you know, once a month or every quarter, just kind of a little snapshot rather than the typical routine of where we actually get updates, just so we get a little pulse on, on where things are in reality compared to what was forecasted. Sure, happy to. Because uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just was making a little note here. So we've had a fire, uh, a pandemic, looks like we're on the verge of a drought. I don't know what's around the corner. And so I just want to know, you know, how we're going to fare through this next episode of whatever that happens. Uh, well, not yet. Huh? <laughs> um, but otherwise, I, I thank you for pulling this together. Uh, I think it's, it does do a good job of looking back into history. So what we think should be reflecting our future, even with the dip and everything else. And I will say that some of the shooting stars that we've seen, whether it be the, the pool program, whatever this year, which obviously you can't always replicate unless we just take over the CLU pool completely and say, we've, we're have we not leaving, we're just keeping it uh, and keeping up that program. But just trying to blend through that, I think it's done, done a good job. And you know what, I'm sure your, your wizardry is, is gonna be as good as anybody's on pulling this together. Now it's just a matter of making sure we, we end up there as best can. So just if you could keep us surprised, I think it's going to be my main concern is, is this, is this real? Uh, and can we rely on it? And maybe we do need to, whether it's as, as our general manager pointed out, find, continue to find other avenues to, to make our, uh, our progress where it needs to be, but then also to be flexible enough to, to adjust where we need to. So I think just having some regular updates particularly this next 12 months as to how things are going to play out as, in, into what you forecast at this point. Absolutely. Okay, so Good job. with that, is there any other comments or questions from the board? Yes, Director Huffer? I guess just to address your comments, uh, Chair Nichols, we do typically get monthly budget reports and periodically we do get um, requests for budget adjustments so I, i'm assuming that will continue in, in much the way we've done in the past mm -hmm. so. yeah I, I, was, I think maybe i'm just gonna be more interested in it maybe in the past because it's just because it's just i wouldn't say it's just the same old same old but you kind of get into a routine of hearing the same things and yeah we're doing well well, it's, but, it's presented a different way. I can make it tie more to what you're tracking on. Yeah, this. just fine. just to kind of see how things are going uh, with, with what changes. So thank you. So this was just uh, providing input. So there's nothing else other than we'll, I'll, unless there's something else, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. And we will continue this until our next meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, see no items for discussion number eight. So we have new items. 9A, public hearing, consider adoption resolution number 060321-A. So I will open this public hearing. Do we have any, just out of curiosity, before the presentation, do we have anybody in the public interested in this, Gabby? Okay, all right. So we have a presentation. Mr. Moody, thank you for being with us this evening again. If you wanna carry on, please. Th thank you, Chair Nichols, uh, members of the board. Um, recommendation tonight is uh, adoption of the resolution um, for approving the engineer's report, uh, confirming the diagram, and ordering the levy of assessment for the district wide park maintenance and recreation improvement district. So, if you remember back May 6th, um, we brought this for a prelim board directed uh, prelim approval, as well as um, setting the hearing date for the engineer's report and this assessment and levy. Um, there's no changes that were made to the report. We did have um, some public communication uh, we, that we addressed with our consultant um, that prepared a letter that's included in your packet. So uh, basically kind of taking a look at um, associated fees to consolidate all three of our uh, assessment districts. So 
uh, with that, I'm available as well as our consultant, Jeanette, with SEI. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Huffer? Yeah, I don't know if this gets directed to one of you or to Jim, but the letter from our consultant about what would be entailed in, in basically abandoning the current district and, and creating a new district, is this a 50% vote type thing or is this a two thirds vote that would be, would be so, required? So great question and Jeanette, our consultants on the phone, um, I, or on the Zoom call, I will take a stab at explaining it a little bit and then let her kind of kind of work off anything I say. Um, so the reason that this letter is in here and connected to the larger assessment is because of the, um, you know, the question that um, Ms. Collins had raised, you know, saying, hey, is, is there a more fair way to do this or could we change things around and have everyone pay, you know, the same, benefit assessment rather than have the, the different numbers for both uh, Dos Vinos and, and Rancho Caneo. So to try to, um, you know, say, well, what would be involved? Because, you know, anything is, you know, in theory possible. We could change Prop 13. We just need two thirds of the vote of the people of California to change Prop 13. Um, so similarly, we could change how our three different benefit assessments work. There, um, property owner assessments. And so this is where I get a little less confident uh, than our consultant, Jeanette, but it, I believe is just a majority of the property owners that have to agree to it. So her letter that we asked for explains what it would take to basically redraw the entire benefit assessment and have a, a property owner balloting to change the assessment from basically $40 a parcel to something closer to $55 a parcel for every single property owner within the whole district. Then thereafter, if that were to be successful, you could then eliminate the, the, ben the current district-wide benefit assessment as well as the two landscape maintenance districts. And then in theory, everyone would be on the same playing field. Now that's as far as Jeanette was asked to do is just provide that information. I can tell you that, and now this comes from me and my assessment of the situation, is to try to get a property owner to vote for that, you have to have the ability to explain to them what's in it for them, or why would they do this, or why should I vote for this? And the combination of all the people that are in Dos Vianos and all the people in Rancho Caneo represents less than 10% of the total population of the district. So we would have to convince 90% of the property owners that they should raise their assessment $15 because it feels more fair and just to do that for everyone that lives in the community. And I'm not saying that's an impossibility because we have really altruistic and nice people that live in the Caneo Valley. But I also believe people are pretty pragmatic. And if you're not gonna give them something more for the money they're not likely to support it and you you know you have to explain to people what you're doing so i just can't see a way that you could do this and get the votes you need um to make it actually pass to do one so that's that's really my component of it and jeanette if you if you're on the phone and can hear me um if you want to add anything please feel free um um, sure. Yeah, this is Jeanette Henson with SBI. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Sure. Just to um, address the question raised by the board member, this is a 50% plus one vote of a, it would be a Proposition 218 property owner balloting. So it would just require 50 plus one percent of the, the vote. Um, and I, I mean, I agree with Jim, it, the messaging could be difficult. Um, it might be difficult to convince property owners to pay an additional $15 a year and not get anything additional. Um, but again, it, it, you know, it may not be impossible, but it is, it's hard to tell. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Jeanette. Any questions from the board thus far? Okay, thank you. We'll continue as our process allows.
Well, let's see. Let's just make sure we have any anything any further discussion from the board or general manager. No. The director Lang. Yes. Is this specific just to the general district assessment area, or are we now also doing Rancho Caneo and those fans? Right now, the board is talking only about the district-wide benefit assessment. The reason that we have this letter in here is because it's the benefit assessments run by SEI and we asked SEI to provide us the quote for doing one, you know, revenue measure and we knew Jeanette could be on the phone with us. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it also would make sense. We would, we would basically do another district wide assessment and likely use SEI, which MRCA uses and a lot of other agencies use for, for prop 218 type assessments. So, um, so that's why it's under this area. It, it raises that issue of like, what would be the, what would be the involved in creating a uh, redoing our district wide benefit assessment? Thank you. Any further questions, either of Jeanette or the general manager or Mr. Moody? Okay, uh, with that, I'll, I'll go to the public. And so, uh, Barbara Collins, if you're able to hear me, you're welcome to speak up to the board. Yes, hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you. Go okay. ahead. Great, thank you. I just wanted to give a correction to Jeanette that it wouldn't be $15 per year district wide if you pull everything together. It would be a one time $15 increase for everyone district wide, and then thereafter a 2 to 5% increase for everyone. And then I also wanted to state that I don't know if would put to a vote to the district that. You know, what's in it for them? What would be in it for them is, would you like to continue to use these parks? Because if we're still going to have to pay these higher fees, but everybody else in the district can use them, then I feel like Dos Fianos and Rancho should get something more than everyone else in the district. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Uh, staff, any uh, comments regarding the uh, public input on that? Uh, I, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I might have misspoke. It, it wouldn't go up $15 like year one, then up $15 year two, then up another $15 year three. So it wouldn't be like $45 more after year three. To adjust it to kind of meet the total pool of money necessary, all of the people that are paying about $40 now, the district-wide folks, everyone would be paying about 55 and then it that would be the new baseline 55 every year with the annual you know cpi so so yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't jump up that 15 dollars every year after year it would jump up 15 dollars in year one and then thereafter it would be adjusted by like the cpi formula i think up to five percent max three percent max mm -hmm. so so yes i i think the speaker is correct it's a it, it would be adjusted $15 up, it would, you know, and so all moving forward, everyone would pay 55 instead of 40 and then adjusting by that 2%. So I don't know if it's a semantic thing, but yeah, it, okay. all right. just Thank to clarify. You. Thank you. Yes, Director Lang. Yes, this is in response to Ms. Collins comment about what Dos Vientos and Rancho Caneo get out of this. Uh, a number of years ago, I attended a national um, conference and uh, attended a workshop that focused on the advantages of your proximity of your property to a park. Uh, the value of your property increases and enhances the opportunity for uh, interest in buying a property. So you're kind of investing in that uh, additional funds that you get based on the proximity of your park. And uh, if it wasn't for this benefit assessment, the park, you know, wouldn't have been built in the first place. So I think uh, you have to look at your long term investment. And what you're contributing is also to the uh, resale value of your your home. So it, it's uh, not a nebulous um, dollar uh, value. It is um, based on property value and based on research 
as I mentioned it, um, I heard a lot of information supporting, you know, the increased value at that conference. So um, I think the homeowners in these benefit assessments, Dos Vientos and Rancho Caneo are getting something. They don't see it maybe right now when using the parks, but long-term, um, the benefit is a lot more than the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lang. Anything else? Okay. All right. Seeing nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And uh, at this point, we have a recommendation to adopt the resolution. So either uh, you have a motion. Yes, Director Lang. Yes, I'd like to move. We adopt resolution number 060321-A, uh, approving the engineer's report uh, for the district-wide park uh, maintenance and recreation improvement district that it be read in title only and all further readings be waived. Thank you. We have a second that. Thank you. Okay. With that, we have a vote. All those in favor to support that? I, oh, no. You, I was going to have a read it afterwards. Do we have to read it first? It has to be read first. Okay. All right. <laughs> if you want to read that in title only, please. Save us the whole resolution, please. Resolution number 060321-A. A resolution approving engineer's report, confirming diagram and assessment, and ordering continuation of assessments for fiscal year 2021-22 for the Canadian Recreation and Park District. Thank you. All right. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That takes care of item A. Okay. Item B, the public hearings for adoption of resolution 060321-B. So I'll go ahead and open that public hearing. Mr. Mooney. Thank you, Chair Nichols. Uh, the recommendation tonight is to adopt the resolution to ordering the levy of assessments for the Rancho Caneo Landscape Maintenance District. Um, again, uh, was brought to the board, board directed uh, on May 6th um, to set a public hearing on this date and no changes have been made to the report. And with that, uh, we're available for questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. This is a public hearing. Do we have anybody from the public that uh, is interested in speaking? Okay, thank you. All right. If that's the case, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and suggest we have a motion. We have a recommendation to adopt the resolution. Anyone care to make that? Yeah, Director Huffer? Yes, I'd like to move adoption of resolution number 060321-B, ordering the levy of assessments for LMD 92-1, be read in title only, all future readings to be waived. Thank you. We have I'll a second, second that. that. All right, Director Lang, thank you. All right, could we please have that read in title only, please? Resolution number 060321-B, resolution of the board of directors of the Naval Recreation and Park District, Confirming a diagram and assessment and providing for the levy of the annual assessments in the special needs district. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor, please vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. All right, that takes us to item 9C, public hearing to consider adoption of resolution number 060321-C. I'm going to go ahead and open that public hearing. Mr. Mooney. All right, so the staff recommendation again is to adopt the resolution ordering the levy of uh, assessment for Dos Vientos Landscape Maintenance District. Um, again, this was brought to the board May 6th. Um, there have been no changes uh, to the report. And with that, staff is available for questions. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from the board? Do we have any from the public that is interested? Okay, thank you. And I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and accept a motion. We have a recommendation to adopt the resolution. Director Lang. Sure, my pleasure to uh, recommend that we adopt resolution number 060321-C, uh, ordering a levy of assessment of LMD 94-1 Dos Vientos, and it be read in title only and all further readings be waived. Thank you. Do you have a second for that? All right. All right, Director Holt. 
And I second. It. All right, thank you. All right, all those in favor say aye. aye. Great title. Oop, oop. Trying to trying to get these moving. You'll get order, it. Chuck. <laughs> Go ahead if you could please read that in title. Resolution number zero six zero three two one dash C. Resolution of the board of directors of the Indian Recreational Park District of California, confirming the diagram and assessment and providing for the levy of the annual assessments and special maintenance district. Thank you and thank you, Director Huff, for keeping me on task here. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That one moves forward. All right, item 9D, public utility easement deed. Who is handling this one for us tonight? Okay. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Thanks, Hare. Yeah, thanks, Chair Nichols, members of the board. Um, a little over five years ago, uh, we did a, a, a Verizon Wireless. We gave them an easement to go which, uh, on Sopway just behind Oak Brook Service Yard up to uh, Edison's Power Poles for the, where they were going to do a wireless facility up there. Um, and then um, in order to bring power up there, uh, they need Edison to go through at that same easement. Uh, we told them, yeah, go ahead, it's, it's fine. But then uh, Edison wouldn't accept the third party agreement. So they, we, uh, they wanted us to deal directly with Edison. So this is the exact same uh, easement over the Verizon property, but for Edison to do the same thing, uh, it's a no cost um, easement because we're already it's for the same purpose that we did back in February of 2016. Um, but you know, so like, uh, yeah, so it, if we at, at Verizon could without the power from Edison, Verizon could get out of the the e easement that we gave them to, to do that. So because they wouldn't need it anymore if we didn't give them the, power, give them the uh, Edison this evening. So with that available for questions. Thank you. We have questions for Mr. Hare. I have, I have one question. Sure. Mr. Is this, I know we have multiple easements for cell service providers and Edison, other utilities and, and such. When these are crafted, is it very specific for only this use on something like this? That is the only purpose for this easement is, it, is to service the, uh, the cell site and for no, no other purpose? Yes. Yeah. And that's pretty, they're all custom made specifically for a single or dual purpose whatever happens yeah it, it, yeah right depends on the situation you know like even uh uh next uh next board meeting we're planning on bringing on there's some uh, like generators we've done in the past before though so we'll give them uh, uh, you know, uh permission to like or we'll amend the lease to use our property for a generator but we're very specific about what you can use uh the easements for okay yeah because i just you want to make sure that we reserve whatever we have as far as your know, rights or abilities that we're just not kind of throwing things out that I know you're very good about that. I just yeah. want to make sure that was made clear. Yeah. And, and they can ask, I said, like with this one, uh, Verizon asked, you know, oh, can Edison use our easement? Like in addition to that, we said, sure. Yeah, you know, like as far we, they can do things with our consent. Mm -hmm. And so we said, sure, go ahead. But then Edison said, no, we want a, we want a separate agreement with the park district. So we good. All right, there's no other questions. There's a recommendation to authorize the general manager to enter into this easement. I have a motion. Thank you. Director Kessler. Uh, I recommend you authorize the general manager to have a public utility easement in the public utility easement Southern California Edison Company from the electrical power line on Southwood Road Community Park. Thank you. We have a second for that. I'll second. All right, Director Lane. All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that one moves forward. Thank you. All right, next is item 9E, Capital Improvements Fund Grant. And who will be helping us with this one, Mr. General Manager? Uh, okay. Yes, I will try my best to help. Um, just before we start, we have there's the three recommendations, and this is, we, we do this every year. It's a, well, this is the 12th, um, the 12th cycle that we've done. So it's been an extremely successful program that we've been doing. Uh, where the previous 11 cycles, we've granted uh, not a little over $937,000. So it's been, I said, extremely successful throughout the whole community. Um, as you remember, when we uh, got the Edison uh, settlement funds from the Woolsey fire, as, as uh, Melissa pointed out, uh, very obviously several different years in different colors and different fashions. Um, the board decided in June 2020 that we should do a little bit different this year. We should do a double matching program. 
and to, to try to assist the community with uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic. Um, so we're going to use some of the money for that. So it would actually a much greater and better interest than we anticipated, which is fantastic. We, we really liked it a lot. And so did the community. We have uh, a little about $450,000 uh, in, in grants asked for in a, in a $30,000 loan. And I'll, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so we've got all a, a range of, of uh, organizations from Amateur Baseball Development Group, uh, the Corbo, the Sopwe, the Botanic Garden, Historical Society, and the Chumash who were here tonight, McRae, ETI, Newberry Park Pony, Pony Baseball, all sorts of different projects covering a whole wide range of, of wonderful things from uh, flow lines to shade structures to synthetic turf at a, 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 a infield to painting and paving and patio improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Again, a whole, whole wide breadth of stuff. Um, however, usually we have, a, we have a review committee that gets together and, and, and talks about this and so how we are going to uh, dole out the, the grant money. Uh, but this year we had two, for lack of other words, um, abnormalities. Uh, we had two groups, uh, American Youth Soccer Organization, Region 9, ASO 9, who's at primarily Canary Creek uh, South, um, they wanted to talk about a public picnic shade structure. Uh, we, we got a good deal. That's the, the, the attachments there where we came to a good understanding for the board's consideration, where it was a combination of the um, uh, our putting in the money for the, the grant, plus an additional money, like the double matching going up to $50,000 and then putting in an extra $10,000 in because it does, it does serve the community uh, quite a bit. Uh, plus, um, they were going to put in uh, $80,000 plus uh, uh, we were going to loan them $30,000 over 10 years. So I just gave you the parameters of that. However, uh, just on Tuesday, their contractor slash supplier uh, was not going to provide what they advertised. So we, we met with representatives of ASO uh, then and they were going to do something uh, for like we're a, little, the, a little funkier than we had anticipated. Uh, so we agreed to uh, hit the pause button, uh, revisit it with another contractor slash supplier, and we hope to bring back this grant agreement to the board on June 17th. We've been exchanging some ideas and, and some numbers so that the numbers will change a little bit um, from what you, what you have here, but we're confident between uh, the good works that ASO 9 does and the good works that CRPD does that benefit the community, we can provide a, um, a really uh, mutually beneficial solution for that. So uh, item number one, the recommendation number one, we want to table that to uh, take that off and continue that to uh, hopefully it's agreed June 17th. Um, again, another abnormality we have is the, the grant agreement with Canal Valley Little League for synthetic turf infield. Uh, not because of the pricing, but because one of the things, generally what we have all our grant agreements, they're usually one year. Uh, it's the, the uh, the organization has a year to complete the project uh, and or if they don't complete the project, the, the grant's over. But with the synthetic turf infield, we met with the representatives of Kenna Valley Little League. We were a little concerned because that's that's setting a precedence and something that we don't uh, normally do or not. Well, we don't have a synthetic turf infield uh, anywhere within the district. And the Canal Valley Little League's primary focus for that was for their challenger program was for the disabled uh, uh, participants that they have when they play their games. It just makes it a much easier surface for them to participate in, um, in which we're, we're very excited to, to provide this opportunity for, the, for, those, uh, for those individuals. But again, but within the product with a synthetic turf infield, um, we, we changed the grant agreement. So it's a much longer grant agreement it's for 25 years. Uh, we would do the, the money part uh, right away, but then uh, Kineva Little League would be responsible for the maintenance operations, repairs, and, and any replacements that needed in during the 25 year period, because the, uh, cause it, it does happen. You know, we, we didn't want, generally when we get an improvement uh, we do the we keep them we get the improvement and then we maintain it but this one we wanted to hand to Canal Valley Little League because it was a little bit different and outside the scope of what we usually do uh, there's if you if you don't know I could go to big details but maintaining a synthetic turf infields is is more challenging than the grass and it's not something it's equipment and daily 
the frog where clean, you could clean it with a broom or there's some different equipment that you might need also. So that's why that one's being presented all, uh, as separately from the, all the other ones. Um, but with that, and then that's the third recommendation we want to make Canal Little League aware of, and we, again, we've had many discussions with them. Um, but so upon doing the research, and I remember we don't own the property at Fiore Playfield. So entering into a 25 year agreement, uh, we want to make uh, Canal Little League uh, aware of that, hey, Edison, we're on five year agreements. And we just approved our, our five year license agreement with Edison I think a couple of board meetings ago that in five, four and a half years or five years, Edison can say, you're out. You can't use that anymore. Or with, uh, and then upon doing the research and doing with, with uh, the city of Thousand Oaks, that, that's a pretty solid agreement there. They've got the, uh, they've got also got a, uh, we have an agreement with them up there. And then looking at uh, the Caltrans agreement, um, figured out that uh, much like the one that portable lease we did with that 23 freeway and Jan's road, we have a portable agreement in for that same location or excuse me, the location off of Arbus for Fiori Playfield, And that's up in a couple of years. And so again, to make Kenna Valley Little League aware of that, I contacted Caltrans and said, well, how do we reestablish this? And they said, well, send us a letter of interest and start the process. So again, a little bit more detailed as far as the uh, usual uh, capital grants programs that we do with ASO and Canal Valley Little League. So that's why we have some separate recommendations here. And with that, I'm available for questions. But again, like I said, we're really happy the way this went. You know, so this is this has been a fantastic program over the past, you know, 11, 12 years and, and the community is really excited about these opportunities. As you heard from Chubash and the stagecoach when they are here, they, they can't wait to, to start their projects. Thank you. Director Hooper, why don't you start us off, please? <laughs> um, just a quick question on, on the port release. You said we've sent a letter to Caltrans, but we've not yet heard No, anything. No, we have not. No, uh, we're, I'm, I'm asking you to authorize us to send a letter Okay. to, to reestablish the, uh, the port release. Is this typically something that Caltrans will do automatically? Or is there a chance or a likelihood that they could reply back and say, "No, we're not going to renew the lease. We have some other plans for this." From the from the indicate yes. So what they what they do is said it automatically uh, uh, triggers a review of the property and their needs for the 23 freeway uh, and, you know, for a future expansion, um, and and they wouldn't tell me one way or the other what what they're thinking but i mean just in my opinion it's it's just it's a formality and they because they they said that uh well then a after they do that review uh, then they could offer us to purchase the property from them or they could um ask us to reestablish the portabilities and and continue it okay i, just, I would hate to see uh little league spend the money to install this artificial turf which i think is great only to have caltrans come back and say sorry after two years we're doing something else with this property yes that's true and that's where i tried to make i said uh we've had the, the, the same discussions with little league uh, about here are the inherent risks of of signing this grant agreement that whether it's uh, edison in five years or caltrans in two years that this this could just all go away are they going to hold off on actually starting this project until they hear back from Caltrans? They didn't give me any indication that's what their intention was. They gave me the indication that they would be starting the project during uh, field refurbishment, so which is coming up in, I'm trying to remember, I think it's in the during the winter time, so in about six months or so. And, it, and by that time, maybe they've heard back from them. We, we've heard back from Caltrans. Okay. Keep our fingers crossed. Yes. They do the right thing. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Director Holt, did you have any questions? No. Okay. Director Lang? Yes. A um, number of comments and also compliments of this program, Tom. I remember when we first started it. And um, now these are the okay. ones that. Is that what you've been standing over I here know. for? Now I know. <laughs> um, We've, we've got the successful ones and so forth. Are there any organizations that submit applications and we have to deny it or modify it or? It, it modify, yes. Yeah. Even with, uh, for 
sometimes even like for example this year um canal canal valley lily actually submitted a an, an additional non-matching grant uh which and i said hey look at page two page two says you can't do that <laughs> and there's oh sorry about that so we've had for, for like words are more they're more administrative denials than than actual outright denials what we um we look at you know and we do this in conjunction with the the the, the capital budget so we look at what we can do or can't do and it, we were you know actually anticipating at first you know six seven months ago we're like yeah probably 200 plus thousand dollars and then just talking to folks and i think i mentioned to the the board yeah where i was like oh wow i think we're going to be around 350 to 400 and then you know may you know may first happened and i was like oh okay four hundred and fifty thousand dollars so we make it we, we make it work if 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 we can and so far in in the the whole time i've been here uh we've never had to say no we've had to like i said modify a few of the um a few of the applications to and make sure we're all on the same page and the, uh, but everyone's been uh, very satisfied with with uh, what we've done for them um very pleased to see the shade structure uh, for AUISO adjacent to the building, I think that's going to be, you know, very popular and very functional. And so organizations be congratulated on coming up with this uh, project. I think yeah, very good. We, we hope we hope uh, we can bring us something. Uh, we come to some sort of mutual agreement. We've talked a lot this last couple of days and hopefully we can come to some, uh, like I said, mutual conclusion and yeah. for the 17th meeting and, and, and the fact that you're concerned enough for its appearance its durability and so forth it's very important for yeah. st structure you, like I, th this. I think bo both groups you know, us 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 and them would want to do the right thing for the community but we've definitely said many many times with them let's do it right now because you know you don't want to you know, three years from now you walk over there and like what did we do you know yeah. so let, let's get it let's get it right yeah and in reference to the uh, artificial turf for the Little League, and uh, again, we think we've all attended conferences when you go visit and talk to these uh, artificial turf people and, and, and so forth. They always paint a good picture, but, you know, like you indicated, there's a lot of uh, additional maintenance associated with it, upkeep and, you know, p potential deterioration of the materials. and. Uh, so when I was reading that, is that you're having them take the responsibility, mm -hmm. I think that's really a good idea. And uh, overall, it's, it's, it was, a, I thought, a very good, uh, complete package. Um, let's see. Oh, I do have a question on page 155, um, the first full paragraph I think I'm sorry uh, 11,200 included okay is, is 11,200 uh, included in the revised proposal it, um, has it okay, uh, and you're at the the now remember if you're looking AYSO region 9 yeah remember we're tabling that we're yeah. That, yeah. So that's that's not at, at the moment that we're not really getting to. I I could. It's not the same. It's not. Gonna it be won't the same. be the same. It okay. won't be the same. What we're bringing in a couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, I was so just it's peeking not, through right. looking at some notes. So I'm. Yeah. Uh, and also, on the even though it won't be uh, voted on, the little league. Field two is the second field in off of Flores. I mean, Arbos. Correct, correct. If uh, so, good. Yeah, field one, and then they have the snack shack and the little sh shade structure there, and then the next field is field two. Okay. I, I didn't see any numbers, but I assume that was the the case. Oh, um, a great you know uh, program and uh, great projects, and I'm just very pleased that organizations like AYSO and Little League and others, you know, uh, will be benefiting from uh, this additional program that CRPD is fortunate enough to be able to uh, offer. And there's not a lot of park districts as 
general manager mentioned, we're probably number in the top six in the state. And uh, so there's, you know, a lot of park district, a lot of communities that uh, would never see any opportunity like this. And to have CRPD as the provider, I think is, is very, is great. So thank you, Tom. Director Cusworth, did you have any comments or questions of staff? Um, I guess the only comment I would have is that I think this is an excellent program. The the additions that you put in here for the play fields and the shade structures, I always appreciate CRPD's attention to quality because I'm a believer that quality is what's important to last over the long time. And I think one of the crowning achievements of CRPD is our community partners. And you could just see from the two women who talked here that their museums would not be what they were. I don't know how many times they kept saying with CRPD support, with CRPD support, with CRPD support. We're so thankful for that. And everyone that you've listened, listed. I also think our community partners is one thing that brings volunteers and community members together. In almost every one of those, that's where you're bringing the play fields, the museums, um, everything. It brings volunteers and people together. That's where you're making connections. That's what makes us more than a city. It's what makes us a community. And I think that's what CRPD has done. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to be on the board was because of our community partners. And I highly am supportive of all the continued support that you do give them through this. And that they, and that you're also asking them, you're not just giving them money, you're saying we'll match your money. So you give us some sweat, you give us some ideas and we'll help you. It's not a handout, it's a help up. And so um, I think that this is a wonderful program. And again, the beautiful illustrations that you've done, the leases, everything, it's all right there. So thank you. It's very, very easy and clear to read for us and for the public if they want to. Mr. Hare, got a couple questions here. Sure. In looking at the list here, I know we've only looking, we only have a couple of items to uh, to uh, give you a, a vote on. But looking at this list here, I was thinking of a couple of things: shade structure, synthetic turf, and then hearing from the botanic garden this evening, their plans for this uh, uh, heritage oak area yet to be decided. Those types of things. Maybe it's outside the box, so to speak. But a lot of these things, I know you, your time and time again, where it's a phased effort where, like the uh, uh, bicycle efforts out at Sapwe, you know, they, they're, it's a phased effort where you're continuing to march forward on, on getting their overall plan built out. But when you see certain things like this, are you critiquing this based on the CRPD policies and standards on, mm -hmm. you know, does it fit and you get checking all the boxes and make sure that, you know, what they're proposing fits all the things that, that the district would do if the district were to build that very same thing. Definitely. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, we, we sent out, I think I copied the board on this year. Uh, it was a little different this year because it was a double matching. I probably sent out five emails to the groups uh, throughout the year, reminder, 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 and, and also told them, and don't just submit paperwork on May 1st and said, does this look good? Um, and some groups do that still, but uh, we, we generally have a, uh, some, a lot of pre-discussions with them to say, well, what are you, what are you thinking? And then even, um, like I'll use Newberry Park Pony Baseball, for example, um, they had, I think it was five ideas with that. They said, well, what do you, what do you think of, of these? Like, is there any, like, no, like that's, that's bad. Um, and I think we actually had one that was bad. And then, then, so then we just go back and forth with, well, what's, what's your, cause they could only do one of the, one of the five I mean, as far as the finances were concerned. So they chose one that was their highest priority with their best use. So then, then we get with them, uh, like that particular one, then staff meets them on site. We walk through it, uh, talk about, you know, like, what are you going to do and how are you going to do it? What's it going to look like? Um, and so that's just the pre uh, application, then they get the application. And then our review committee is uh, uh, has uh, myself, Andrew and, and Matt Kuba, 
uh, are on from the park side. And then we also have uh, Timmy over there and, and Dana from sports. Uh, we all get together and, and talk about review. So it was great. Um, uh, we have great questions from different angles, like, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, so we do have a pre pretty thorough discussion um, uh, in the committee meeting. And then if, if, you know, um, you know, if the grant agreements go, then I assign a uh, representative from my division to oversee the project mm -hmm. and make sure the scheduling. Um, I know like what would like an example with the stagecoach is you know, talking to Jana that you know, very concerned about, well, when's it going to happen and you know, you know, how is it going to happen, how, how things are going to do and work and how does it affect our work. So we try to coordinate our schedule so not to they're not interrupting our, our, our work and we're not interrupting their work and going back and forth. So it's a, it's a pretty, pretty extensive process, but um, we, we do collaborate and coordinate with, with the individuals. Okay. And when, and I see obviously with the synthetic turf, that's a little different category. Land issues aside, leases and ownerships, uh, with something like that, you say, well, hey, we don't do synthetic turf. So then what does it take to have something like this move forward? So, yeah, yeah, but we still really want it. And so is this where you say, okay, well, we got to got to find a way to make it work then. Or, mm -hmm. or are there times where you just say, no, no. It's well, we, we were, I actually, we went into a meeting with them about a month ago on site with the, the, the contractor slash supplier met us out there with a representative from Canal Valley League. I had, uh, I was out there with, uh, uh, our maintenance guys were out there too. And we said, okay, are you aware? <laughs> just kind of like, here, here's all the things we think um, that, you know, are, you know, do you know what you're getting into? And the, and they did, you know, the, the, like the, the manufacturer, uh, he also did work for TO high school and he's also done work for Simi Valley little league. So we, we spelled it all out and said, this is, this is, here's all the different concerns that we have. Uh, gave them a draft of the grant agreement and said, here, you know, this, this is this is how I'm writing it. Please pay close attention to this paragraph and this paragraph because this is unusual and 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 the the land uses we're talking about. And they said, hey, we're we're all for it because we're we really want to help the our challenger division and yeah. help the kids. Um, yeah, and there and that's that's something I, I really uh, I'm proud of what Canal Valley Little League is is about is the the challenger division. I know. Uh, there, that's a big concern of theirs, or, or they're a big proponent of the Challenger division that they mm -hmm. have. And we've done some last grant period when we did the, if you remember, we did that sidewalk improvement from, uh, I think it went all the way from field one all the way down to field four. Um, and then we did some extra work going from this, the sidewalk into the dugouts and the bleachers for to help out with their Challenger program. So I think it's a really commendable that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's obviously the rationale for it is mm -hmm. fantastic. I don't argue that at all. I just, you know, some of the things I heard about synthetic turf, I know Glendale did some soccer fields in synthetic turf and that lasted a few years. And they said, ah, we want grass again, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know Major League Baseball, all synthetic turf, and nah, now they're all back to grass again. And with the football field, it's like, I mean, they practically have an armed guard around that, those football, what they can and can't do because you don't want to ruin it. So. I just want to make sure that uh, they are fully aware that this this is a, a it, while the the intention is good, but there's a lot of mm -hmm. issues that they have to keep up with. We, we yeah we even, even to the point a uh, little side story we're, we're sitting there talking about it. Yes 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 we got it. Two, two eyes open two eyes open two eyes open, and then on field one there was a dad and his five year old kid practicing practicing sliding, which was a lot of fun to watch because the kid. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, no, he was, he would just run, hop, hop, and then like sit down and the dad's going like, yeah, okay. But uh, it was fun. But anyway, so like talking to them, I said, hey, I'm glad you guys are aware that you can control your coach and your players and your fans and do that. Look over there. Someone's going to show up here just to play and they're going to go, oh, I want to go play on the synthetic turf. So, you know, I, you're, I, we talked about signage and all that. So yeah, you're going to be responsible for just the casual user coming and and you know you, they're talking about sunflower seeds and gatorade and, and all and gum all oh, these yeah, oh, yeah oh, there's yeah. Oh, there's all those different things that happen yeah. so right you're like you're talking about the armed guards yeah, yeah. It, it basically they said no we're we're in it but this is what we want okay i said okay all right uh 
then the other thing that caught my attention was the shade structure because we just were approving official shade structures. So does this now have to comply with that policy that we just? No, th this is actually a metal shade structure. That the, the USA shade is a fabric shade structure. Okay. So yeah, so it's a little bit different. When when we we actually did consider we, we when when we prepared that last report for the purchasing policy and the standardized equipment, uh, we do have more different you know uh, needs. I guess you would call it for metal shade structures. You know, so they, they do different uh, vary throughout the district. So you know, rather than for fabric, we definitely wanted USA shade, but for uh, the metal shade structure, we do have a little bit more flexibility. Okay, and with with that in mind, not that I want to get into the you know details of this, but when you have either something like this that you're calling a shade structure, or you have the sails that you call a shade structure, or these you know, I don't know, I'll call them plastic umbrellas over playgrounds that are shade structures, and then you have the uh, the picnic gazebos over at Canal Community Center over there, which are shade, are they all just shade structures, or do they have some technical terms where it's this kind or that kind? Of just just, out just, of curiosity. just yeah, and, and generically, yes, they're all shade structures okay. because they provide shade. But then you know, we said yeah, fabric shade structures and metal metal roof shade structures. There's there's all sorts of different types of shade structures. And there's the trees. And, and, the tree, and, and then natural shade structures, that is correct. <laughs> we need a permit for those too. Okay. And the last question I had was I just was very impressed with the $937,000 being granted. You're almost getting to a million dollars there. Uh, but what I was also curious to is what, what's the value of the return of that investment? Um, you know, not that I'm trying to measure it and say, hey, are we doing a good job? Because I know we're doing a good job. But is there some way that we were, we're tracking? You say, well, what did we get as a community from this investment of over a million dollars? Uh, you know, wh how do we measure that and say, what was that a good investment? And, and how do we track that? They say, yes, here's what we've, what we've gleaned from that because not only did, was it the $937,000, but we got more than that back from it. Mm -hmm. So is, is there some way to track that? Um, I, you know, not numerically, I, I don't believe so. And, 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 and I don't know if I brought this up last year or, or prior, but I know when we created the program, one of the uh, the impetus of, of this program was when my kids were playing sports, I was on the boards and doing everything. And so, so 15, 16 years ago, and hey, we're going to raise money. And I'd say, okay, well, for what? They're like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, if I go to my parent, Chuck Cover, I say, Chuck, I need some money. He's like, for what? <laughs> you know, you, but then if you say for a batting cage and his kid's seven years old, he's going, that's cool. Here's $50 versus zero or 10. So that that's where kind of got me going on this, that we, you know, these organizations had ideas or even even with that, like even and I'm you know, picking on you, Chuck, because you're right here in your right. One, one of my top five favorite board members. <laughs> Um, that um, then we'd also do this. Oh, Chuck, you're in charge of the, the batting cage. I got it. Well, Chuck was in charge of registration. He's also a coach. He has a job and he, and he's got a family and he works and he's doing all these different things. And it'd be the end of the end of the baseball year. How's that batting cage going? Sorry, you know, cause it wasn't the highest priority. So anyway, so, so when I start, when we started this program was, Hey, organizations, you know, make dream something up and we'll match you with with the uh, yeah that's it's to me that again it's not numerical but it's more of a um a community incentive that we have received such positive feedback from the groups and galvanized their nonprofit organizations or their 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 patrons that they have to turn this into you know, it was 937. This that's pre this year. So that's 937 plus another 400,000. So we're yeah you know, we're up to four point or excuse me, 1.3 million dollars. Uh, so we've done a lot of good in the community. Um, and then even another story I'm going to talk. We before we didn't have a non-matching part, and that came from the first one or two years we didn't have a non-matching part, and it was the Las Flores Community Garden, who's got an annual revenue of about three thousand dollars a year, so they almost have no ability to to match. And one time, we we're out there, and they talked about we didn't spend a dime for two years, so we could buy this two thousand dollars shed. Mm. And I felt so sorry for them, going, "That's awful that I couldn't help you out, you know, buy something." And Karen Lindsay said, "Well, 
let's have a non-matching portion for up to $5,000, you know, so that way we can just, it's a good program, go ahead and give it to them. So, and it's, it's met with such great joy from all of our partners. I think that's, again, not numerical, but it, it's amazing the amount of wonderful things and how appreciative our partners and their constituents and, and the improvements they've made on, on our property. Well, I think it's, it sounds like a good marketing opportunity here to share what we have gleaned this because I would suggest that if we've provided $937,000, that the community has matched that with $937,000 if, if most of these are matched grants. And so basically we've got a two for one deal as a park district that, that our efforts has been doubled. And then going back to Director Cusworth's comment that it, it encourages the community partnerships and now you've got a community working together as a community. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more to it that you, you're right. You can't put a dollar on all that, but I do definitely think that you could double that easily and say, by, by that 900, by that million dollars, we've gotten $2 million worth of stuff, mm -hmm. whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say it's a, it's a no brainer to move forward with that. Okay, so we have, is recommendation. Oh, Director Lane, go ahead. Yeah, I have a little technical question for either Tom or Andrew, and, and then a general comment. On page 175 at the bottom, we talked about the infill system, uh, the top dressing, and so forth. And you talk about um, the rate of the sand of six pounds per square foot. Now, is there sand that's maybe eight pounds per square foot or two pounds per square foot. And how do you de they determine what is proper for that application? Yeah, well, there, there's, so this is yeah, the uh, uh, proposal from the the, uh, right. co the contractor. Yeah. So yes, you, you can have um, for like a denser or heavier sand. If you're, uh, I know, it, you know, had a great time at uh, uh, Judy's joint a couple of weeks ago, looking at the drought response that was happened over on, uh, on, uh, can, can, I can't remember the name of the street now, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so no, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it just, just like concrete, you know, you can have denser, denser sand too. Like we have, there's playground sand um, and there's building sand. There's different types of sand for different types of applications mm -hmm. that you could use. Um, and, and that gives you the, the proper amount of whether it's you're playing in it or you're, you're walking on it or sure. you, you need to put something underneath it so you can bounce on it. Yeah. Well, the fact that I, you know, read that, um, and you can close your ears, Melissa, I probably spent as much time reading this item as I did the budget. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, and but I, <laughs> and general manager might get a little kick out of this, but as I was going through the contracts back to 1972, 74, and reading the names of the council members, Bowen and uh, uh, shoot, Glendo, Glenn Kendall. And it, it really, because I knew these individuals and it really brought the meaning of what these people before us did together as a community and brought it to, uh, not a head, but brought it to what it is today, the CRPD, and all the things we're involved with. And uh, I just really f felt proud to, to know that there's a lot of people that have contributed to CRPD and the city and to make our community what it is today. So anyway, keep up the good work, Tom, with Thank you. your uh, program there. Very good. Okay, thank you. So we have recommendation from staff. We're going to table item number one, but there's a recommendation in item number two and number three to authorize a general manager to enter to create a uh, grant agreement with Canal Valley Little League and also a letter of interest to the state of California. There's a motion to uh, move those forward. Director Hopper. Yes, I'd like to move that we, and I guess as a point of order, is it more correct to say that we're tabling this item or deferring this item? My, my preference would be say that we're deferring the item to a future board meeting pen, pending the uh, revisions of bid between the efforts of CRPD and AYSO Region 9. So I recommend, I, I would 
move that we defer item one and that we approve staff recommendations two regarding the um, synthetic turf program with Canal Valley League and approve recommendation three regarding the Caltrans Porter lease. Thank you. Do we have a second to that? I'll second it. All right, Director Lang. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much and thank you for that detailed list of information there. Okay, next is item 9F, Parks and Planning Division Personnel Actions. So Mr. Hare, are you gonna take over this one or? Yes. Okay. I would thoroughly enjoy it. Um, so a cu couple of things, you know, the Facilities Maintenance Division, um, we, we took a good look at the, uh, what, uh, the, the job titles and the specifications and the compensation that the maintenance workers um, are currently doing versus uh, uh, what they're what they what, what they're doing versus uh, what what is described. Um, so we, we took a we took a really it's a really good look at that what 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 it takes to perform their jobs. So what we did was in conjunction with them and uh, we also worked with the union. Um, we you have attached uh, some revised job descriptions from um, the for the maintenance work. It used to be maintenance worker two, maintenance crew leader and building maintenance supervisor. Now it's more for facilities. And, and in general, it's, it just gave, again, gave a better idea of what they do. Um, and then rather than just buildings, because one of the things that we're concerned about because it's facilities that they actually do work on the parks a lot. They work on playgrounds and parks and pools and all sorts of things. So the job title was, was, was very important that we did that. So I've included in, in the original the red line strike through and also the proposed for um, for all three for the fit facilities maintenance workers two crew leaders and supervisor um, and then uh, in addition to that so we took a look at the, the actual skills that are required to to do those jobs um, and we took a look at um, comparable pay and, and comparable positions for other local agencies uh, uh, that are in, in southern california um, and then in addition to that, and then we are trying to, and then we converted to like we're apples to apples and to make sure that, that it was this, this, the same, you know, using some baselines and some um, a cost of living adjustments. Um, in addition to looking at for other agencies, what we also did was um, look through in the, in the entire district uh, like um, for, and that's why we gave on page uh, 299 where we have the salary schedule for all the full-time positions we have a uh, strikeout and a proposed as you can see like the maintenance worker two uh, was a range 41 and we're proposing for a range 43 because we think the maintenance worker two uh, it requires a special skills um, that are very in line with the other range 43s for the grounds worker three the irrigation techs and the equipment operators um, and then the crew leader uh, the maintenance crew leader going from a range 45 to 47 that has uh, the same type of skills that the lead ranger possesses so we want not only again comparing to other positions other similar positions with comparable agencies but also um, other positions with our own agency and and just to note uh, we, uh, we intentionally make uh, at least three mistakes in the board packets um, so see if you guys are going to find them out um, so chuck did find one of them um, so on page 299, he correctly noted to me that we struck out maintenance worker two and it should be facilities maintenance worker two on the new one and then facilities maintenance crew leader on the new one. So uh, I appreciate that. Ch Chuck did catch that. So good, good job on that. Yeah, it's, yeah just we do, we do that. We do that every every board packet. We always make intentional mistakes for you, you guys to for you guys to find that. So, <laughs> so. Is that right, um, Aline? <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be me. Shailene just processed it. I'm the one making the mistakes. That, that's all my fault. Um, so the facilities maintenance, is, again, for the facilities maintenance guys, it's changing the job descriptions and also uh, changing the ranges of the, the worker two and the crew leader. Uh, the, the personal actions are included in the, in the next, in the next two year budget. That's about $33,000 annually to, to make those adjustments. And then I also want to talk about the supervising park ranger. It's been a while since we've had a supervising park ranger. Uh, we we reclassified that one a years ago. We've always had the position, but as as we mentioned before during the budget, and I think and Chuck actually talked about too about the increased uh, increased salaries that we're having. Um, 
we're going to be hiring a supervisory park ranger very soon. You know, and so we've got the supervising park ranger plus three other ranger positions coming up. Uh, our intention is to hire that supervising park ranger first. So obviously he can, he or she can be part of hiring the other three rangers. Um, so that's, that's going to happen uh, pretty soon. But then we want to take a really good look at the job description of the supervisory park ranger. And, and so then that's also attached is the original red line strike through and the final version of the job title. Uh, with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Hare. Questions, yes, Director Lang. Yes, Tom, for the most part, these uh, positions that we're moving up um, based on their skills, et cetera, are they already occupied those positions? Do yes. Have staff in yes. all of those? Uh, well, I'll take it back. We're, we, are, we are, we are, we, I forgot about the one because it's been so long. Uh, uh, we did, uh, I don't know, seven, eight months ago, right? Where seven or eight months ago, we are uh, we did authorize an additional maintenance worker two position, uh, because when we took over the teen center, senior center, and the uh, and so that new positions requirements were to do that plus the pool, the community pool, because uh, the the additional responsibilities for that group. Uh, unfortunately, we've been we think a lot has to do with the pandemic. We've been unsuccessful in, in three attempts now. In, in finding qualified candidates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That uh, concludes my questions. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Hare? I have a question. On page 269 of the packet, this is re referencing your facilities maintenance <coughs> order two on qualifications, education, experience. It refers to with a specialty in at least one building trade preferred. How is that specialty confirmed? Uh, well, well, we, it's a lot of, it could be through a different, uh, a variety of things, just experience. And when, when we talk to, when we do the interviews, uh, we ask a lot of questions like the last, uh, and, and, and this is one reason we did put it in, um, because the last person we did hire, um, you know, we want to make sure they were uh, uh, proficient in all aspects of building maintenance. And then we always ask them, what's your weakest, what's your strongest? Um, and this particular person, his strongest was in, in electrical. And he says, you know, I've uh, this, so and he's, he, you know, so we asked him lots of poignant questions about that, you know, I'd say a proficient person would know the answers on how to do it. Uh, talked about his experience in, you know, he actually did own a, a electrical side business and, and it's not just electrical to hook up light fixtures. We're talking like dealing with 480 and, you know, high voltage, uh, high voltage Color electrical. Panels. Yeah, yeah, so a lot. So we, we, that's how we verify it, you know, and we do, uh, everyone does take a test um, and just, and again, it's for, it'll be all aspects of building maintenance, but then uh, we would like, you know, again, preferred, that someone has a, they're, they're not just a generalist, they're okay and or satisfactory in everything, but they actually uh, would be preferred if, you know, uh, this one's a, you know, HVAC and this one's plumbing and this one's, uh, you know, electrical. And then we do a lot of cross training so they could teach each other on uh, their skills. Okay. I was, I was curious because the qualifications say it's a journey level position. So I think, well, if this maintenance, does that mean they need to have a journeyman's license or certificate in electricity and plumbing hvac you know is there something there that you say hey yeah here's my license this it, proves that i have it it, it could it, it could the, the journey um um uh, the journey level there's several different ways to what the, what the definition of journey level is and that that is one of them to actually have a um, the certification that you are have a journey level experience, excuse me, a certification, but also through education and experience, you could also be under the, the definition be, you know, be a journey level mm -hmm. uh, just just by your experience without getting a yeah. certification. And that's just listed as preferred to keep the pool of applicants open as wide as possible. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah, I've been through this process before. I know it's kind of hard. We want to identify things, but not restrict things. Correct. So, Okay, thank you. If there's no other questions, we do have a recommendation here. If I can get back to that page. Let's see here. here we go. 
Yeah, recommendation. We got uh, four recommendations for job titles, uh, and to re to approve job titles, reclassify facilities maintenance worker two, reclassify facilities maintenance crew leader, and approve the job spec for supervising park ranger. So we have a motion for those. Yes, Director Huffer. I'm going to move approval of staff recommendations one through four, since you already read them, and I'm going to read them again. No, I'll second that. Okay, we got a first and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Wow, all right, so we made it through all of our new items. Okay, so we get to our reports and announcements. We have a few items in our packet. Were there any questions from staff of any of those items? Otherwise, they're informational. Okay, seeing nothing, I will move on to department reports. 11A Parks Division Report. Mr. Hare. Uh, thanks, Chair Nichols, members of the board. Uh, two items. Uh, again, next time uh, we anticipate bringing the Cuneo Community Park Assessment uh, and Design Contract uh, with uh, ADG to author ask you to authorize them to go into construction documents. And so Andrew will be here again if you, if you haven't got sick of him yet. Um, uh, again? To, yeah, again, to give a, a presentation on, on that. Um, and and uh, so we're really looking forward to that. In addition to that, we're looking to adopt the uh, MND for the project at the, at the same time. So pretty exciting stuff. Uh, and then I also, uh, I know some of you also were there, the, that CSDA meeting, uh, or v, a VCSDA meeting uh, the other night. Um, really excited about that. It was um, Ventura County Regional Energy Alliance was um, doing the presentation on that. I've already reached out to them. I, uh, when I was with the city of Thousand Oaks, a lot of fun, a lot of great partnerships with them that we had when I was at the city of Thousand Oaks. I uh, started it here when I was with the park district. We got a couple projects done and I said, it's, it's a valuable, valuable program that they provide. And then around the third project, they said, oops, wait a minute, we don't do special districts. And now they do, so it's, it's great. So I'm really looking forward to get back into uh, working with them and hopefully bring some, because we do have some um, uh, interesting projects coming up that we could partner with them and get their guidance and, and their wisdom and contractors and rebates is what we're really looking for. So we're excited about that. So I'm available for questions. Director Holt. Not a question, but um, I was on Zoom with, with that program for the BCSDA, mm -hmm. and I was very impressed with the questions you asked and the application for some of these things for our district. So thank you. It, it was, uh, you know, we got a lot of information. It's going to be cool. Electric yes. vehicles. That's, what, yeah. that's, that's the, the one I'm really, yeah, yeah. fleet for the know, fleet. That was that's going to be cool <laughs> if that's true. Uh, we can help they can help us with that any questions over here okay oh director Huffman. since i was unable to, to attend that zoom meeting could you just 30 seconds tell me what this sure is? Well, the, the the best thing the best thing for them is they they have their pulse on uh almost like a grant writer like jim was talking about before that's their job is to understand what the state is doing and what the the public utilities are doing they're funded through the puc for to look for opportunities to, to help agencies like ourselves do uh, save energy, whatever that means, you know. So and then the, they're looking through grants and they've got rebate money. They've got they've got the conduit. It, it's a whole myriad of things that it's hard to understand, but that's their job to understand. So they partner with us and like some of the projects that we we've done here, simple stuff. It was uh, relamping Borchard uh, Gymnasium, and so they go, oh, here you go, here you go, here you go, here's the contractor, uh, here's the price, pre-approved price, it's a state contract, and make it up, you know, $30,000 project, and here's a check for $7,000 when it's all done for your rebate. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then then it's done, you know, and then otherwise we could have done it and made it cost us a few thousand dollars more and we never would have got the rebate because we didn't know about it. So, but that looks like, sounds like they're dipping their toes in other things, like I was mentioning, like the, the fleet, like electric, electric, because uh, that's going to be coming up for, for the Air Resource Board, that they're going to be doing zero emissions. So they've got their, their, their fingers on the pulse of many, many different energy conservation programs that are out there, uh, and even like solar too. 
So that's that's kind of interesting. Yes, yes. So I've already, so I've already sent them. I took our ten-year capital pro, uh, plan, which the 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 retrofits of the uh, sports lighting's on there. I've condensed it from whatever you know, whatever three hundred projects down to applicable fifty projects or forty projects, and said, "Here you go. Love to meet with you to talk about these." And they said, "Cool. We'll get back to you." And so hopefully in a couple of weeks I'll meet with them. Couldn't you just ask them to send a check? I wish. Yeah, yeah I wish. Yeah, they, they, yeah they, I, I, but yeah, they, they do a whole, and then part of it too, Chuck, they do an analysis. You know, so when, if I would fix something to the board, like, oh, the return on investment would be, like, say for the retro lighting retro, or the, it's 27.2 years. But with this rebate, it's down to 12.1 years. And so then at least when I present to the board, I go, let's, this is worth it. Let's mm -hmm. do this. So that they, they do everything from the, actually the contracting to the getting, finding the rebates to doing the analysis. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hare. All right, Recreation Division Report. Mr. Durer, again, welcome. Glad you're here with us tonight. Thank you, Chair Nichols, members of the board. Happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm just gonna recap a couple of the highlights that were in your packet and then preview some of the things coming up in the recreation world. So we were talking about the pool earlier and on Sunday, May 16th, we had a big uh, leak over there. Dee called it a new water feature, but uh, <laughs> yes, she yes. was uh, being. <laughs> I, I was. I was. I, I would give you an opportunity. <laughs> but uh, quick, always quick on her feet. They were able to move their programs over to the CLU pool, and thanks to Tom's awesome maintenance staff, they were able to fix the leak and get the pool up, uh, back up and running within a day. Um, and then on uh, May 19th, the Teen Center hosted their annual middle school golf tournament at Los Robles. We had 17 golfers, and it's just really cool to see the Teen Center get some programs going again. Mm -hmm. um, as of Tuesday, Ventura County moved into the yellow tier, allowing us a little bit more flexibility in some of our programming areas. Um, we think well, most of this is temporary until June 15th, and then that'll change again. So. Some of the highlights on that is that uh, indoor moderate contact sports can now resume indoors, so including basketball and, and our racquetball. Um, social informal outdoor gatherings can now allow up to 100 people. Private outdoor events and picnic rentals can now allow up to 200 people, and that must be with a private guest list and seating chart, which our picnic reservations have, has been doing for a while now. Um, indoor fitness classes and bingo can um, take place with up to 50% of the room capacity when indoors. And then outdoor live events and assigned seating uh, with assigned seating may occur at 67% of venue capacity. So some of the highlights that, that affect us. Um, coming up really quick here, uh, the week of June 14th is our day, our summer day camps will begin. Uh, our remaining summer clubs and summer programs will begin or resume or excuse me, begin the following week of June 21st. And at that time, our community centers will also be fully reopened again and back to our pre-COVID um, operating hours. Yes. Additionally, yeah, we're very Ooh. excited about that. Um, additionally, the, the summer beach bus will be returning as well and operating the weeks of June 21st through August 6th with the pickup and drop off locations at the teen center and Borchard Community Center. Um, Goble, uh, I mentioned um, seniors have been really excited to get back in the building there. So their plan is to reopen on June 28th once the county um, wraps up their vaccination center. Mm. And uh, wasting no time, bingo will resume on Tuesday, June 29th, the very next day. <laughs> And uh, it will continue to be held as it was before every Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday moving forward. Um, the senior nutrition program will continue as a drive-through program um, for the time being, um, but it will be reducing their hours from 11.30 to 1 p.m. instead of 1.30 p.m. Um, and then lastly, we had our, our first summer concert last week. That was a success. And then uh, moving forward, the next one's July 4th, which is after the June 15th date. So the remaining four will once again be free and open to the public without assigned seating. So we're excited to have returned to a sense of normalcy here pretty soon. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Fantastic. 
All right, Director Holt. It's not a question, but I want to thank you for the concert on Memorial Day and the arrangements that you made, and we all had our little seat. Of course, some of these before wound up having seven, three little ones along with it. <laughs> it was cute. I mean, they were separate from everybody, so it didn't matter. But uh, it, it was very well done, and I know it was a lot of work. Um, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thanks to Tom staff. They helped with painting those boxes many, many hours. So thank you to them. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for Tim? I, yeah, I had to say I stayed for a few moments after the stage presentation at the concert, and I was talking to uh, Tim about the setup, and he was telling me how the uh, team, the, the uh, ground screw decided, hey, this is just like setting tile. You know, <laughs> we'll start in the middle, and we'll just go across <laughs> over here, and we'll go across over here, and we'll mark it as we go. And he said, it worked out perfect. So, so here you get the creativity in the ground screw. You know, so it just, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me as to how this, this staff from top to bottom has, you know, been given a challenge and met the challenge and gone beyond. It's just amazing. And I told Tim, make sure he gets a picture of it. But it and, we, and he also said, I hope I never have to use it again. <laughs> <laughs> Director Lane. Question for Tom and or Tim. Um, was that flour or chalk? that you use to mark the, I mean, the... That was actually a field paint. That's what they use to um, do like the soccer fields and... Um, it's biodegradable and that doesn't harm the grass. Field. Correct. Because yeah. there's a, a lot of it. And, um, oh, the Global Center uh, Cafe, what's that scheduled? Uh, reopen. That's a good question. Um, they haven't they haven't determined a date on that yet. Um, they're going to look at initially maybe doing some hybrid indoor and outdoor. Um, but I think concerning the grant, they can't yet move the senior nutrition program back indoors yet. So they're going to continue with that, and they've got it down to a really good system. But um, but they are bringing some things back inside with uh, like on July 29th, they'll do a Dodger game with the food like they used to. Mm -hmm. It'll just be in the auditorium instead of the cafe. July so, 29th? Correct. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for you yet on that, George, but I know they're they're kind of going to get it back into the building, kind of see how they function in it again, get back to their programming, and then they'll look to reopen the cafe when they can. Yeah, as you may know and others. Um, I, I would bring a group there of seven, ten people once a month for breakfast, and it, it really provided a neat environment and camaraderie and so forth. So I'd like to know when that opportunity presents itself again. We'll get our group over there for breakfast. I'll be sure to let you know once they have that plan. Thank you. Yeah, Director Hover. Yeah, I guess just as a, as a follow on to that, I, I would be a little bit concerned as we get into the summer with the folks sitting out in their cars, even if they got air conditioning going, but also concerned about the staff, even though there's an easy up there, it gets pretty hot, it's going to be uncomfortable even, even under the easy up. So I would hope that sooner rather than later, they're able to move the, the program back indoors. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stewart. All right, and we'll go to Management Services Division Report. Melissa. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair. I think you all heard me talk enough, so I have no report, <laughs> and I'm available for questions. I don't see any questions, so. Thank yes, you. Melissa, you want to tell us how excited you are to do a two year budget versus a one year? <laughs> very, very. Twice as excited, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And general manager's report, Mr. Friedel. Yeah, I think this would be a great opportunity to thank Melissa once again for uh, her first two-year budget with us and uh, compliment her on, you know, working again with Tom and Rochelle and, and all the management services staff to really pull something together that I think, you know, every year we try to just do, you know, a little bit better. And I think she really 
is taking the document up a notch for you know the way it conveys information and the graphics and stuff. So thank you very much, Melissa. Really appreciated. Um, just a, a couple really short things. We do have a closed session, so uh, don't run away. Um, we do have a few. Um, just kind of let you know we're getting um, kind of like I would actually say inundated with requests for volunteer projects. Um, you know we've had. Uh, churches and service clubs and sports teams and everybody that's um, the, as the COVID restrictions loosen and people can get together. People are, this is an amazing community, the hospital. Um, the, the, so we don't really, we can't say yes to everybody that's asking to volunteer because everybody's, you know, staff all have their sort of day jobs and it's hard to drop everything and work with a, a big group of volunteers and just telling someone to walk around a trash bag in our parks is not super fruitful because our staff do do such a good job with that part of it. So we are going to, you know, be looking more and more at um, trying to come up with some very specific, deliberate, big scale volunteer projects. Um, trail work days is obviously one of the easier ones to get up 200 people all doing the same thing. But, um, you know, I, I, I've had to just tell some folks like maybe there's a different place you can go but we don't really have a place to manage you right now because sometimes they'll call and say I, I need you, I need to come with you know x number of people on this date between these hours do you know give me a project and it's not that easy for us yeah. to do so in case you get any kind of uh, folks that contact you that might be frustrated with that response uh, just know kind of that's where it's coming from and if you need to put somebody in touch with me feel free um, but but we will be saying yes to more and more. We're thinking about some of the things we can be doing. Um, then the only other thing I would say is we've been managing the agenda pretty well and have you know a meeting on two weeks from now, and then our two July meetings. One is which is on July first and close to the Fourth of July holiday. So right now I have a bunch of stuff on June seventeenth and July. Uh, 20, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, June 17th, July 15th. Right now, I don't have anything in the tentative on July 1st. So I'm not saying tonight would be the night to do it, but I might say on June 17th, if we've got all our business managed, that we may not necessarily need to have a meeting on July 1st, just managing our, our board schedule. So in case anyone was thinking of going out of town or whatever. Um, and with that, uh, again, we do have a need for a closed session. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Yes, Director Lane, and then we'll yes. go to Director Hepper. Uh, Jim, kind of on this COVID transition back to normalcy, uh, when will the board be back, set up and back as it uh, previously was? That's a great question. I um, So the OSHA guidance, um, I guess, is published today or it's it's in so they had uh, Melissa knows better than I but apparently she clicked on when OSHA was starting their meeting and they had 800 public comments like 800 speakers I guess I, mm. so, so a lot of people have opinions wow. on how OSHA should wow. deal with the mask stuff and some of the yeah. workplace requirements so I know it's like there's CDC guidance and then there's our OSHA guidance and then there's the general public health guidance and we have to triangulate all of those and do kind of something that complies with you know all of those and um you know we're, we're trying to do that soon i'm hoping possibly by the next meeting but depends on the osha guidance probably more than anything so I, i've got a couple more follow-up oh. different okay um i'm assuming based on your um forecast that the pancake breakfast and the uh, home run derby will take place? So as of right now, for, for July 4th, we are having the concert. We are resuming the pancake breakfast. Right now, the home run derby is not scheduled. Um, I talked with sports today. They, they are considering doing it. Um, at the time when we were planning the brochure and everything else, um, adult sports was not really happening and they weren't allowed spectators and it was more of kind of like a social gathering that with the home runs as part of it mm -hmm. 
Um, and then Patty was going to survey the seniors to see if they were interested. And she, she told me that they, they weren't going to, they weren't going to do that. So, um, as of right now, it's not planned. Um, but Deanna's going to kind of reach out and see if there's interest. And, uh, she's also during COVID has kind of ha hasn't had staff on board to assist her, but as she's starting to get some more and leagues are opening up, she, she's probably capable of doing that at this point. That's great. Thank you. Director Huffrey, you had a question? Well, my question was similar to Director Lang. I was just wondering if Cal OSHA had come out with anything, but apparently it's still pending. So I can just answer a little bit of it. They came out with kind of their proposal, and then they were hearing the public comment today. So the proposal had a bunch of different recommendations for employees outside, inside, masks, unmasked, the quality of masks that you're wearing, different things like that. And then they had over 800 public comments about it. And then they're going to be releasing guidelines. I'm not sure when, um, but they've got a lot of pressure to get it um, out pretty quickly. So we'll see what they come out with after that. Director Cusworth. Um, okay, you're okay. All right. I didn't have any questions, so thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, next is director reports and follow-up reports on meetings, conferences attended. We'll start to my left with Director Huffer. And you can throw vacations in there too. I've, yeah, I've got nothing to report other than having been in Seattle, packing my bags. Really sorry that we've got a closed session meeting tonight because I have an 8.30 a.m. flight tomorrow morning out of LAX. Oh, so bad, bad decision on my part. <laughs> Off to Hawaii tomorrow morning. We drive there now and then sleep in the. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Director Holt, do you have a report for us? Uh, not really. No. Okay. All right. Director Cusworth. Uh, well, I just wanted to say for the uh, meeting on Tuesday, I was really glad that Mr. Hare was there because they were talking a lot about electrical charging stations and electrical vehicles seem to be the theme. And I thought, I don't really know how that's going to fit in with us, but. Of course, he knew exactly how that would fit in with our with our board. So it is nice when you know the administrative staff is looking at those agendas and coming in. I assume that was that wasn't a coincidence. Yeah. So um, thank you for being there. And then just quickly again, I also enjoyed the Fourth of July Memorial concert. It almost brought me to tears seeing everybody having a good time. And you and Michelle running around in your red shirts, mm -hmm. um, making sure that everything was working properly. It was very, very nice. And um, also, I was at the uh, Stagecoach Inn first meeting that they set on Zoom. It took them a little while. They're a little bit older than the staff at Chumash, who gets into the social media and has everything going. So take them a little longer. But they are hoping to get more and more of those presentations up. They have Mike Malona talking about um, the history of movies in Canal Valley was very interesting. They're probably going to put it on the website if anybody's a movie buff and wants to know about that. So. Very good. Director Ling. Yes, kind of on that copy. Uh, what's the uh, forecast for McCray Ranch to start open up for their um, movie nights? Uh, well, right now they're scheduled for August and September, I believe. Yeah, and. And I think they're potentially thinking of maybe a cowboy cookout in October, but that's just something I've kind of heard. Yeah. So I don't think he has that definitely scheduled. So yeah, they're they're going for it. Good, good. Mm -hmm. And um, again, Tim, thank you for, as already um, mentioned by other uh, directors, thank you for all that extra work because I know a lot uh, was involved. And in my little group there, uh, as I mentioned to Doug, I think, and maybe someone else, they uh, were very uh, impressed with the parrot heads. And uh, I told them I was going to go check out the membership requirements for the Ventura <laughs> chapter, and we all might become parrot heads. But again, very, uh, very good. I don't know if you are were involved in the selection of the group uh yes i usually select them and and because all of them were canceled last year with the exception of labor day we were fortunate enough to be able to roll them over to this year so they they
they came from Fresno, but they were it was their first show in a really long time, and they were really happy yeah. to do it. So, um, yeah, but thank you all for coming. It's always great that you guys support our programs and our events. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking to a few of the parrot heads backstage before they got started, and uh, what a what a wild bunch! The great great guys, very friendly, yeah. very you know, congenial. Uh, but they they were said they were really thrilled to be with us because they, where they left it was 106 degrees. So they said this is fantastic. We'll come here all the time. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great concert. Enjoyed it as I mentioned. Was there a talk with a number of the staff and a few of the folks that were out there, and I think everybody was really enjoying themselves and just was grateful to be back doing what they like to do. So thank you for the staff pulling it together. Uh, I know both rec side and the park side for making that happen. It, it, uh, it was a bit of a challenge, but pulled it off. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I attended the Zoom portion of the May 25th Thousand Oaks City Council meeting, another five or six hour affair uh, on the general plan update, which they finally approved. So we, at least we well, it's not officially approved. They, they moved it forward to the next step. It still has to go through, but at least we kind of know where we stand with that. And uh, they kind of downgraded a few things. They probably read some of that in the newspaper as far as the capacities in some of the areas, whether it's mixed use, you know, 75 feet or 55 feet or 35 feet. So that'll affect a little bit. But the bottom line is that the number of units is still going to be 81,000. So that, that number didn't and won't change. So. How that unfolds remains to be seen, and uh, we'll, st we'll still need to be a close partner with the uh, not only the city, but I think with the school district on how we start accommodating with this, uh, however it unfolds. Obviously, it's going to be a long-term process, but we'll still need to be engaged. Just uh, thanks for Jim and his crew for being actively involved with that. Uh, on June 1st, I was able to get a, a very gracious tour of the Hill Canyon Bridge site, which is, I know, kind of a Costco thing, but nonetheless, it's providing access to Wildwood. And so I was out there with Brian Stark and Anna Huber and Matt Kuba. And so they kind of gave me an idea of where things start and stop, where the bridge was going to be, some of the issues that they're facing, environmental. Uh, and they were pointing out, uh, you know, Chuck knows this, that the public works department is actually taking the lead on the project because they find it beneficial. They can actually use it to get their vehicles across the stream from the Hill Canyon Treatment Center up to the uh, facility up on the hill on Rancho Canal Boulevard. So they're taking the lead and paying for most of it too. So it's kind of an interesting process. But I was I had never really been pointed says yes it's going right there. So I was actually get able to get to see it and say, okay, this is how it all fits together. So uh, thanks to the staff for making that happen. And then yesterday, what was it? Yeah, no, Tuesday. Uh, maybe it was yesterday. I don't know. The week has gone by fast. Because of Monday holiday, everything seems a little bit off. Uh, had a Caneo, you know, I always do this, C-A-R-P-D. Uh, we had a, um, they call it a board retreat. Half, they usually all go up to Sacramento, but uh, most of Southern California staff stayed down. I said, hey, I'm going to be seeing you all in a few weeks. I said, I want to spend the money to go up there and, and do it twice. So I just did it on Zoom. It was about a four or five hour meeting that we had. And what I, a couple of things I want to point out is during that meeting, we actually reviewed an application from the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District to become a member, and that was approved unanimously. So that'll be a good, good partnership to have with them. Uh, if you're a member of what group? The California Association of Recreation and Park Districts, CARPD. I'm missing something. Mid Peninsula wants to. Oh, that part I missed. Oh. What peninsula? Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. They are uh, up in the well, the San Francisco Peninsula. The uh, San Mateo County, Santa Cruz County, Santa Clara County. And they have about 26,000 acres and it's all of redwoods and very well funded and very well respected. In fact, when I was on staff with Costco, I went up to see how they did things so we could learn from them. Uh, 
uh, and they, yeah, so so they they uh, do they they do things right, and so they'll be a great asset to have them, uh, and because the even though it's called the Recreation Park Districts organization, it does have within the bylaws to have a little wider variety as far as what type of districts can be part of it, including community service districts if they have a park and recreation component. So that's why they're able to be part of this organization. But it'll be good to have them. Uh, I was I was telling uh, Jim during conversation, when you have, well, just like you mentioned, LA County has no rec and park districts. We have three. There are counties throughout the state that have none, some that have multiple, some are huge, some are small, some might be two or three people. Um, and some might be a community service district, which is really not rec and park totally, but so there's actually quite a disparity in what people think, even within that board, the way this organization should go. So it does take a lot of, a lot of kind of working together and compromise to, to make that happen. But that was good to have them there. Yeah. Uh, update the registration is up to 80 participants for the annual conference later this month, which is the most they've ever had. So we've got the highest registration for this. And they have the largest amount of money spent for, for uh, sponsors this year also. So they're not sure if it's because we're the only game in town that we opened up sooner or they're willing to come and spend the money, but it'll be a good conference. So looking forward to having that happen. So that's a quick update on that organization. So next is item number 12, request for status reports and items for subsequent agendas. Anything for you? Yes, Director Cusper. So um, I know that uh, we have pickleball on our agenda. I think that it needs to be moved up from 10 years and we need to take a more active stance towards pickleball. So I would like to um, see if the staff could come up with between five to 10 sites, either our property, school district property, um, property that isn't going to be valuable in being commercial property that people might want to, you know, buy that we could potentially work at. And I, I kind of have a little bit of a list that I'll email to Mr. Friedel and maybe in a month or so we could come back with just something that we could be saying we could potentially because we do own some land um we could work with the park district uh, the school district hopefully how could we open a conversation up with them or is there just some condemned land somewhere that nobody wants i don't know but maybe that could be something that we could look at and then at least the pickleball people know we are making an effort because I think, and also we need to be looking at the changing population in Thousand Oaks. This is a need. There may be some other areas that 20 years ago were a big need, but maybe they aren't as big of a need now and how we want to make that work. So that's my, um, my request for a subsequent agenda. If we could put that on and maybe a month would that be a good amount of time what would you say um well i think i guess the degree of precision with uh with respect to the you know i think we could come up with an analysis of a variety of sites and some quick like quick pros and cons for the board to kind of you know consider you know i mean I, I think some of us could right here think okay pros and cons of this site or that site so i'm sure we could come up with um a list of sites and some pros and cons. Um, the capital budget is supposed to come back along with the regular budget next meeting. So moving that up 10 years is more of a, uh, maybe maybe that would be something where I would say, because I think it's year 10 or something. Is Correct, it it's, yeah, it's your, it's your 10, yes. Because, okay. So yeah, so the board could move that up during the next meeting if it wanted it before it approves the, the, the final budget. Um, I don't know that we well, have a sense of the price or anything. Uh, it, exactly, just, so that, that's that's the, the, the hard part of right. that. Again, remember what we talked about last time, it's not not that we don't wanna do the project, but not knowing the site or the, 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 the depth of the right. project. And we do, we do on purpose balance years one through nine. So if I don't wanna throw in just, you know, a million dollar project or a half a million dollar project and it's not enough or whatever and it like we're messes up 
all the other projects that we that we have a better yeah. feeling of. But but I said, but if an opportunity, if we go through this exercise, I wouldn't say. Um, well, it's still your ten. We could theoretically move correct. it up if that became yeah. a priority. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It, it's yeah. your ten, and then we actually come back in a, a, a month or so with better ideas and get direction from the board to go this way or something like that. And that's not to say that, that if something comes in, whether it's two years from now or three years from now or something like that. Yeah, as it becomes more refined, you can move you can move up the project. But right now, it's still uh, uh, very conceptual, extremely conceptual. We don't know how big or where. Uh, or with who yeah. or how or it's, we don't know I'm, any of that. I'm not really asking that we move up the project. Yeah. I'm asking that we open up oh, sure. investigation. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could do. Point. We could do that. We Absolutely. could do that. No problem. And so I'm thinking maybe in a month. If you want to yeah. do that in two weeks, that's fine. But I'm just saying, let's start looking yeah. at things that we could realistically, perhaps yeah. do. Yeah, we, we mean, yeah we could yeah, we could like like Jim said it's it's easy enough to. You know, just what are the basic criteria that that's needed? Uh, why do we need it? Um, and and then uh, we could identify a bunch of sites and all the pros and cons of each site, so the that the board could uh, just it's info item or give us some guidance or direction on. It could also be something where if in the next year or two, we are you know perhaps going to have an influx of funds, it might be something that the public would be interested in. Correct. Investing yeah. in. So, but we, we would let, have to have a plan. Yeah, let the general manager establish when it can be agendized. We did have a discussion about that last year. It came up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We and then we just uh, yeah, yeah. And then and there's a pickleball association that that wrote a letter. To yeah, the school we, district and copied us. So we can we can. I I don't think it's that tough to come up no. with no. some list of sites. And and frankly, the boards probably we if we all did our own list, we'd probably have ten of the same, five of the same possibilities. But yeah, we because it needs a bathroom. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we've waiting, ever you know. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah. think we've ever like put it down on paper. You yeah. Know? So yeah, yeah we all we all that. have ideas, and we say, well, n no, because of this, this, and this. Okay, move on to the next one. Well, no, because of this, this, and this. But so yeah, well, we can I'm, certainly yeah we certainly yeah we certainly could put that all down on paper, all the different ideas that we've had in the past, and and uh, the pros and cons of each site. Well, we did get the letter from the pickleball association, mm -hmm. who said that they wanted to contribute money and they would fundraise. So if we have people, I don't know how much money, I don't know that they could give us millions, but it just sounds like there is interest in this, there is public interest in this. Um, we just need to have a starting point. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, sure. we'll do that. And, no and I, you know, um, yeah, sometime in the next two months, maybe? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can bring that back, certainly. Anything else in item 12? Okay, thank you. Do we have anybody from the public waiting to address the board? Thank you. And so that concludes everything that we have on our standard agenda. So I'm going to allow Mr. General Manager to at least state what we're doing in a closed session before I adjourn our meeting. And you'll be very happy to know it should be extremely short and we do have some people coming on. Um, we have a need for conference with labor negotiator, labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6, district reps Friedel, uh, administrator Smith regarding labor negotiations with SEIU uh, International uh, regarding salary schedules and fringe benefits. And um, no announcement is expected. And we'll get closing in a special memory of somebody to so that yeah so um yes, I have we could adjourn the regular meeting now to the special meeting yes so let me do this uh we're going to adjourn in the memory of bob marchesano is that correct yep. did i pronounce that correctly uh bob marchesano who is crpd's park superintendent for 10 years died suddenly last week after his retirement in 2007 he remained in thousand oaks where he grew up he was always proud to say that he was one of the first classes to graduate from Thousand Oaks High School. He particularly enjoyed his work with Musicians on a Mission, a nonprofit organization devoted to creating connection and to inspire giving through music. He is survived by his wife, Kathy, and seven children. So in his memory, we're going to adjourn this meeting.
and uh, proceed to our closed session. So thank you for the opportunity. And then here,